2014. Uh, we have a lot on the agenda. Uh, we will begin right away with public participation. Mr. Harrington, Stephen. Good evening. My name is Stephen Harrington. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 13, and I'm here tonight to discuss uh, the disparate impact that the Arlington Public Schools discipline policies have on minority students. Did you know that an African-American student is 11 times more likely than a white student to suffer an out-of-school suspension in the Arlington Public Schools? I'd like to draw your attention to two pie charts on the screen, but I guess I can't show it tonight, that's found um, at the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Justice using 2011 data provided by the Arlington Public Schools. Um, it shows that um, black students make up 3.6% of the student enrollment, yet they suffer 24% of all out-of-school suspensions. If you adjust for white students' disproportionately smaller suspension rate, it turns out that a black child is 11 times more likely to be suspended than a white child. Earlier this year, you received a Dear Colleague letter from the U.S. Department of Justice and Education outlining their concern of exactly this type of disparate impact from board-approved disciplinary policies, policies that can be found to discriminate against minority students. I quote from the DOJ, American, African-American students are more than three times as likely as their white peers to be expelled or suspended. I'm trying to understand Arlington's almost four times higher rate than the national average, and so I looked at all the surrounding towns, including Boston, and I compared them, and it turns out, and I show you the chart, you have, um, Karen has it, that Arlington has the highest rate of all surrounding communities, including the city of Boston. In 2012, the Massachusetts legislature enacted Chapter 222, which requires public school districts to provide alternative education for suspended students. I couldn't find any reference that this body acknowledged that expensive mandate or any tutoring expenses incurred. Um, you know, some might claim that you know, this is sort of a harsh accusation, and I don't want to believe that any of you are racist or intentionally formulating policy that it's discriminatory. However, this body does have a history of discriminating against an educator and counselor to the METCO program, the program that brings minority students to the Arlington Public Schools, as the Massachusetts Department of Labor Relations determined in 2012. Earlier this year, one committee member took to the local press to complain about the costs of METCO, perhaps revealing an unconscious bias and an unwillingness of this committee and administration in fully funding the costs associated with educating minority students. I don't have the time or the patience or the $50,000 for public records to update the disciplinary data for the 2014 school year, but the importance of your potentially discriminating policies cannot be overstated. Uh, without a suitable response from this committee, I will be asking the Office of Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Justice to open an investigation into the disparate impact to minority students in the Arlington Public Schools disciplinary policies. Thank you very much. Mr. Harrington. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Uh, tell me you remember from Precinct 15. Uh, I would have spoken actually at the last school committee meeting. Uh, however, I was uh, out of town. Um, I'm here talking about the, an issue that's very important to me right now, which is the Community Preservation Act, which is on the ballot this uh, November. Um, <clears throat> you know, as a lot of people know, we have a lot of projects coming up the road. Um, Arlington High School needs to be rebuilt, Stratton Elementary. We even have Minuteman, um, three really important projects. So to me, you know, you might guess my shock when, you know, I hear that a majority of school committee members are supporting the CPA tax. Um, you know, as someone who has a three-year-old sister, someone who has a, you know, sister at Arlington High, this does really bother me um, that, you know, this seems to me a, a simple, uh, it should be a simple choice of priorities versus special interest. You know, priorities versus nonprofits, pri uh, schools and kids versus um, what isn't necessary. 
And I think the choice would be obvious. You know, let me also be clear, I'm not questioning anyone's commitment to the Arlington schools. You know, it's just a question of judgment on this issue. Um, my biggest concern after, you know, hearing in town meeting uh, Al Tosti discuss um, what he believes could be a possible danger to the Arlington High rebuild is if this CPA tax passes and the Arlington High School rebuild tax does not pass, you know, that is a huge possibility. You know, people are being taxed tremendously, 61% tax increases over the last 10 years in Arlington. So right now, I would really like for school committee members to really reconsider their position on this because if the CPA tax does pass and Arlington High doesn't get the tax it needs to help be rebuilt or Stratton School, to me, that just simply seems what I can only, uh, what I can only call for one of better words is fiscal child abuse. It doesn't seem to be anything but that. And it's really disturbing that, you know, we're even having this discussion right now. Let's pass the three school rebuilds first. Put children in schools first. Let's put special interests where it deserves to be last. Thank you very much. Thank you. That ends public participation. And at this time, I would invite uh, the town manager to come forward. Uh, we're going to be talking about the open checkbook initiative. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, we wanted to give the committee tonight a brief presentation on the open checkbook <coughs> web portal uh, that the town has been developing. Uh, quick history, as I think a, a lot of you know, we've uh, invested a great deal of time over the past couple of years in putting out uh, comprehensive financial documents and last year rolling out um, the web-based Arlington visual budget. So we see this tool as sort of the next step in um, financial transparency or uh, data accessibility uh, on the part of the towns and the schools, as you'll see uh, school data being contained in this. So uh, earlier this year, we applied to jump on to a community innovation challenge grant that the state issues that had already been applied for and awarded, but had some extra funding, uh, and they were soliciting extra communities. Uh, so we signed on to that. And then over the course of the past few months, Andrew and Ruth, uh, the deputy town manager and town comptroller, have been working with Munis, uh, the town and school's uh, financial software, uh, accounting software provider, uh, to build this site. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask Andrew to walk through some of the highlights of the site and then allow the committee to ask, uh, ask any questions it has. And I'll close by saying that we would like to launch this site before the, uh, before the end of October. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the school committee, um, I think Adam did a good job at uh, setting the table of uh, how we've gotten to where we are today. So uh, this is a real robust program and platform, and I think you can have a, as great of, uh, great a degree of interest you have in many of our financial uh, components as you would like uh, when you access it. But for tonight, I'm going to hit on uh, a couple of the major components and uh, would be happy to take any questions. So this is the home page, which once uh, launched will be accessible through uh, arlingtonma.gov. Uh, you will do all of your navigation from here. You'll see there are five uh, primary components, uh, category, department, fund, government area, and vendor. Um, throughout the whole program, you'll see that there's a traditional display um, of data and in most cases a graphical display of that data. So I'll start by going uh, with fund. So most of the focus is on uh, expenses that are uh, paid through the general fund. Um, what this does is it breaks down all of our fund types, general fund, special revenue funds, enterprise funds, capital projects, OPEB trust fund, health claims trust fund, and student activity fund. So what I'll do is I'll click on uh, special revenue funds. So you see how it's... Um, organized here. It's miscellaneous special revenue, and then if you scroll down, you'll see it's broken down. Um, oh, let's see, where's, where's the school ones? It's not pulling them all up. No, that's just special. So basically what it does is um, these are all uh, special miscellaneous special revenue funds. Um, that are either uh, in the custody of the town or the school department. But let's say uh, if we 
clicked on foreign languages. You would see all the vendors that were paid uh, through that special revenue account. So if we were to click on uh, Blackboard Connect, mm -hmm. uh, you'd see there was one transaction uh, on October 21st, 2013. It came out of um, the office supplies count uh, in the school department. So like I said, you can drill as deep as you want through this section. You can go into school revolving funds, school grant funds, town revolving funds, town grant funds. Um, another uh, area is vendor. So under this icon, you'll get a list alphabetically um, of all the town's vendors. Just give it a second to pull up. So you'll see on the right what the town top vendors are. None should be too surprising. MWRA, uh, which provides water and sewer. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is our GIC payment for employee health. Um, Arlington uh, Contributory Retirement System, Minuteman, and so on. So you can search um, if you have a vendor's name, um, but for the, for the sake of this, we'll hit ABC Equipment. Mm -hmm. And you'll see there's a number of transactions the town had with ABC Equipment. Uh, you get, again, you get the payment date, the account, the category, what department it was paid out of, and uh, the amount uh, of the transaction. From here, I'm going to go the payroll. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the page, you'll see all the different categories of pay. So regular pay, overtime, detail, stipend. And what uh, Ruth and myself did is we went through um, all the pay types in Munis and basically dropped them into these categories. And I think we've uh, covered most of them. So if you scroll down, you'll see all the positions um, in the town, and it's all searchable. So you won't see an employee's name, but you'll see their position. Um, so if you're interested in, let's say, a teacher in one of your buildings, you could do Hardy search and you'll see guidance counselors uh, or uh, department you'll say hardy and then bachelor elementary master elementary um, you'll see what their earnings are uh, to date in fy15 um, i'll tell you that this updates automatically because it's integrated with munis on a weekly basis what the earnings were in 14 and what the uh, earnings were in 13 and then you'll see base rate and the reason for that is and i Hope to show it. Here's an example. Um, regular pay, uh, longevity. Um, so the two different uh, pay types under that position. But to maybe go outside the schools, I'll do um, police officer. And if you click there, again, you don't know the name of the police officer, but you just know the position. Um, you'll see all the different uh, categories of pay uh, for that one position. So regular pay, overtime, longevity, and so forth. Um, so I'm happy to show you uh, any other function of the site or answer any questions you may have uh, regarding uh, what was presented tonight. How is this different from the visual budget? So I would say this is uh, several layers deeper than our, uh, AVB, Arlington Visual Budget. Um, that is really to give um, <coughs> you know, ordinary resident an opportunity to ha have a high level um, overview of the town's finances. So for instance, in public works, you could click on expenses and you'd see their expense budget. Or if you uh, selected uh, fire department, you may see three quick categories uh, versus every vendor they've contracted with over the course of the year. So I think this is uh, much more robust uh, in the level of detail it provides the resident. Ms. Susan? Um, yeah, I just wonder about teacher salaries. Um, so there's always a question about how summer pay is calculated um, and if it's uh, so, so the question is will there be any uh, distortions because teachers are paid on a eight or nine month salary and they sometimes take it over the summer and they sometimes don't does Te that make sense Te teachers are paid uh, contractually either 21 payments or 26 payments right so is so there any way I guess I, the question guess is if, if, is so, there a distinction in this? So I don't think there's a distinction. I think what would happen is, let's go back to Hardy. If you had mm -hmm. a teacher on 26 weeks and a teacher on 21, mm -hmm. um, the teacher at 21 weeks 
their pay would be higher at the end of that week than the teacher on 26. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the fiscal year, it would be the same. Yeah, but some of the payments are coming what, after the yeah. end of the fiscal year. Well, but I think this, the way this integrates with Munis, this will catch what's paid after the fiscal year and put it in the right fiscal year. Okay. Okay, that's, that was my question, whether there be any distortions. Um, so, but it go, it, the fiscal year starting in July or starting in? J July 1. July, July okay. okay. Um, and then I have a question also about the visual budget. So are we going to continue to update the visual budget? Um, it, it seems like a really nifty tool. I like playing with it, or is it something we're not sure about yet? Um, so first, we see this as a, a, a complement to AVB, but we're uh, very much committed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, this, like I said, will update every week, 52 weeks a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we update um, AVB uh, less regularly. Mm -hmm. We uh, update it when we propose the budget. We update it when the budget's approved by town meeting. Mm -hmm. When we set the tax rate, we update it then because sometimes there's revenue adjustments. So rather than have 52 updates a year, there's probably four or five with AVB. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to, like there's a commitment then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, to, okay. to build on what Andrew said, mm -hmm. so AVB is what we say we want to do, and mm -hmm. it gives that functionality of a taxpayer to be able to say, okay, you know, my tax bill is X. Mm -hmm. What portion of that dollar goes to, you know, Y service, A service, mm -hmm. B service? And it's much more of a, I, I say, a, a policy tool. Mm -hmm. You know, where's the town investing its resources? And it's, and it's simply put, a budget tool. Right. I'd call this an actual tool. Right. Um, okay. And eventually, and I know Ruth has been having conversations with the vendor and it's not there yet, mm -hmm. we'd like them to cross. Because mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, you want peop uh, people to be able to compare your budgets to your actuals to see how you perform against the mm -hmm. policies that you've set forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, I'd say committed to AVB and updating it as that budget presentation, mm -hmm. and then providing this as an actual tool or maybe even a trust but verify tool for mm -hmm. some citizens who just want to see where the dollars are actually being spent. Okay. And we do have the ability both here, I clicked on site links and at AVB to link one to the other. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good. Any other questions? Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, okay. I, I, is this something we're buying from a vendor that's more or less prepackaged, or is this something we're developing in house? Mm -hmm. um, we, at, at, at first, are not paying anything. Like Adam had mentioned, we are participating in a CIC Community Innovation Challenge Grant through the uh, State Department of ANF with several other municipalities. Um, basically, the development of this has uh, been in the hands of Tyler Technologies, which is uh, the owner of Munis. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we've given them information. They've uh, integrated it. We're still talking about what this would cost potentially into the future. So this is uh, really being developed by Tyler? Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, first, I wonder if the CFO has any comments about this. Um, partly I'm thinking, I remember there's some things that Munis doesn't have enough space in the header to give information. Well, this, as you see, um, with some of the detail about the vendors, this isn't capturing things by code or using the specific Munis description. I think it's grabbing the codes and matching it to a different descriptor because these are not the descriptions that sit in Munis. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some kind of translation going on there. So this, I think this is much more readable when you look at the expenses than when you're looking directly at Munis. Mm -hmm. I do a, a slightly different translation when I export the data for the monthly reports mm -hmm. and I match the descriptions by the account codes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, the whole gist of it is to try to describe in words what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I was very concerned initially that uh, particularly we protected the confidentiality of our special ed vendor relationships for schools and tuition. And I think they've done an excellent job of making sure that that's clean. Mm -hmm. You know, that was as soon as I had access, that was the first thing I checked because that was the thing that worried me the most. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, at, everybody did a great job. Okay, great. Um, then just on my behalf, I, to be clear, I understand that it's public information to have the teacher's salaries, but it really doesn't sit well f with me to have that be something as accessible as this is. I, I just, I think if I was a teacher and had this up, it would make me feel uncomfortable and I, I don't know, it just, it doesn't, I don't like it. Um, so I understand, I understand the desire for greater transparency and everything, but I find this, and, and it's not just the teachers either, it's kind of, it's, it's the, all the employees. Um, I just, I. Just. I as a former teacher back at 72 and currently in a lot of communities, you're identified by name. When I started and for all the time I was there, it was William Hayner, 
master's step seven, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the chart would be right there and be very easy to determine by name. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, this is not identifying by name, am I mm -hmm. correct? That is correct. It's just positions within the building and stuff like that. Yeah, so, okay. I mean, so there's, mm -hmm. it's halfway there. So then the one other thing I'm concerned about is whether there's any disagreement and by disagreement, I just mean there's a different name in this versus a name in our budget. And so people will come and say, you're spending this many dollars on office supplies and you know, we're calling them stationary or something. And, and just that there can be confusion because of that. I don't believe so. I mean, we're both, both sets of reporting are coming off the same codes and the same transactions in Munis. And um, the positions in terms of the salary are identified a little differently. Your position control in the budget um, has a position control code, um, alphanumeric. Mm -hmm. And here they're identified by their payroll codes. So you'd see something like Masters, in Masters 526 or something like that, which tells you that it's a, the degree and the number of pays in a cycle, whereas I'd identify it as, you know, uh, Hardy Grade 5 Teach or something like that. Um, so there, there isn't a correspondence in the positions, but you could probably figure it out without too much trouble. Okay. Is that the only? Yep. Adam, did you want to answer something? Yeah. Oh. I want to yeah. just one response about the payroll. Um, you know, you know, I think I can speak for myself, but probably any public employee that one of the least favorite parts about being a public employee is that your salary is publicly available and it's mm -hmm. public information. And mm -hmm. I, I completely understand with, with my job, it's even much more available in mm -hmm. public, and it's not a great thing, but it's a thing. Uh, so we had a lot of dialogue with the unions, uh, both school and town, about this, and that's why the names aren't mm -hmm. on this site and just the titles. Uh, but with that said, I, I feel pretty strongly that um, you know there, there's members of the community who post this information publicly. Mm -hmm. The local media will post this information from time to time. And I feel like when that happens, there can be a certain taboo that occurs. Uh, where people find like they they feel like they're accessing information that's been held secret, mm. uh, whereas if the town and the school are really the hosts and providers of this information on a regular basis, I think it diminishes that taboo. Mm. So, I, I don't expect that to fully um, take care of your concerns, but that that is the uh, sort of the, the the way I look at it. Okay, thank you. So, just to clarify, how often how often is this updated? Uh, it updates weekly. It updates weekly, and is this this is a this is a public information tool. It's, it's not necessarily a tool that you use or, you, or we use that the, the school district and the town uses to, you know, modify policy or make uh, changes in, in strategy. I would say that's correct. It's okay. So that, that happens with the multi-year planning and looking at trends. You guys do that internally Absolutely. and explain all of that at school committee and at town meeting. Correct. And finance committee and board of selectmen. That, that, correct. That's, that's right. Okay. Thank you. I had just one question, just clarification. Uh, when it goes down to the salaries and stuff, are you showing the, uh, the weekly salary? Are you showing the annual salary? Pardon me? Year to date. Year to date. Year to date. Okay. Can I? Yeah, I just want to point out that if you take a look at many of the town's annual reports, they have the names and the exact dollar figures that people have been paid. Right. So it's not uncommon in New England for a town government to have all that. Right. Uh, we also have our pay scales in, so uh, you, you've got a pretty good idea what somebody's getting paid anyway. Exactly. Uh, I, I think this is a, a good compromise between uh, not being so uh, granular that you can Google it and get somebody's name and their actual salary versus being able to do the information, although the Herald has routinely gotten dumps of salaries of public employees in various departments, including the, everybody in the UMAS system, and putting them in a searchable database. So, you know, it, it, I, th this, I, I think, is hitting a good balance between uh, uh, public's right to know and, and, and not just overexposing our staff. Yes. I'm just wondering how you would deal with something, potentially someone went on maternity leave or some other health-related instance where they aren't being paid, so all of a sudden they're, sal I mean, I'm concerned that people can infer something which isn't publicly, public knowledge from what's happening from the data. And uh, I just, I am concerned about things like that too. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess at any point, someone who was separated from service, left the district, there could be less than a full year's salary that is demonstrated. I don't, I, I don't know that you could necessarily infer the exact. You could infer something occurred in their employment uh, relationship with the with the uh, the town or the school. But I, I, I suppose that's a fair question. We could... Uh, we one thing this doesn't um, capture is compensated leave. So mm -hmm. if they took a one day of vacation, it's not going to say 7.5 hours of vacation. Or if they're out for 12 weeks on FMLA, it's not going to say uh, 12 weeks is sick. So um, it's, it doesn't break it down like that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to uh, MCAS analysis part two. Part two. Part two. And we're going to take a moment while we get everything set up, and hopefully somebody will put the lights back on. Oh, we're going to leave them off. No, 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 really? Leave them where they are. Okay. Right Dr. Chesson, uh, Mr. Coleman, and, and Mr. Rosa. Mr. Rosa, would you come up? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, bring another chair. Why don't you bring another chair? Good evening. Um, I have uh, two able assistants tonight in case there are questions that you would like more detail. Um, both uh, Ms. DeRosa, who works in the um, literacy staff, and Mr. Coleman, who um, is the director of math, are here tonight. And they have been working very closely with teachers and analyzing the MCAS data. Um, so they may have a level of granularity that um, I'm not as expert on as they are. Um, they're also, I'm gonna focus tonight on just the MCAS slides. There are some slides in here that um, we incorporated that actually came thanks to Mr. Schlickman that um, go back to the accountability, but we co t covered accountability in the last time, so we're not gonna go over those slides. So if I skip over slides, it's not like we don't wanna discuss them, but we did mm -hmm. discuss accountability in the last time. Before I start, I really wanna emphasize that Arlington is a very high-performing district. Um, and when we look across the board, the uh, percent of students that proficient in advance, whether it be at ELA or at math, is very high. In most cases, 75% or higher. Um, when we get to that point, um, we will find that this, the remaining students, moving those students to proficient and advanced, is quite difficult. It's, it requires um, us to make decisions about our resources in, in a very, very, um, difficult way because we need to make the decision um, and I used as an analogy today a game of Jenga because we may pull resources from one place and put them in another place but what we want to make sure is that we don't disturb the students who are already scoring proficient in advance who may be utilizing services um, in order to keep those scores. We may have students at the top of proficient that are almost too advanced and we may want to put some resources there so we constantly face a balancing act as to how we move resources around. So we're going to talk a little bit about the ELA results at the district and then the grade level. Um, the same thing for math and the same thing for science and then just briefly um, talk about the plans for the next for this coming school year. Um, I'll, I'll stop at each subject area to see if you have questions at that subject area before we go on to the next one. Um, and that was also, this is just to remind people about the accountability that we covered the last time. Um, and then this is the only accountability slide that I'll talk a little bit about just to refresh people's memory um, that the areas we had that did not meet the goal of 51 um, really the one area that's that's we have the concern and that we're going to be working on um, the most will be grade uh, six um, grades six and seven math I'm sorry in ELA and grade six and seven math um, were very very close to 51 and considering the um, the finiteness, finiteness of the uh, metric um, could easily have been 51. So we're gonna talk a little bit first about um, overall performance for the district. As you can see, as we said before, this is a very high performing district. If we look at the district as a whole, um, across the board, pretty much 85% of our students um, score proficient and advanced and are above um, the target of a 51 uh, median SGP in ELA. Um, you'll see that we've been at that place pretty much over time, and the state has also been pretty much the same place for the last four years. So um, we're, we're pretty much the same difference from the state that we have been all along. 
Um, looking at the percentage of students that fall into each category over time, if we look from 2011 to 2014, um, you'll see that we always have a, uh, the vast majority of our students, again, scoring in the advanced and proficient um, with a very small number of students and then needs improvement or warning and failing. And these were the, um, the accountability slides, so I'm just going to skip over them. So now talking about um, comparing at each grade level the percentage of students that score proficient and advanced um, for the state and for the district. And the top line, which is the white line, is for the district, and the lower line would be for the state. Um, as you can see, uh, since about um, 2006 to 2014, we've had some movement up or down a couple percentage points each year, but for the most part, we're pretty much holding steady. And while one may think, well, that means that we're just kind of um, stalled out or stagnant, um, I want to call to your attention that we've been doing this with, um, especially the last couple years, we have one less FTE in terms of reading than we've had before. We transferred that FTE to math coaching. In addition, um, since about 2011, we've been dealing with the introduction and then the full-blown Common Core. Um, that is a much more difficult test, and we'll talk about that as we go along. So we actually consider this um, success, that we are able to maintain the same level of proficient and advanced with um, a cutback in FTEs um, with a much more difficult test, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, the same thing we see for fourth grade, that um, we're pretty much holding steady in the gap, being the percentage that we're above the state um, in terms of proficient and advanced. Oh, sorry, and we see pretty much the same thing for grade five. Um, when we look at the elementary SGP by school, um, we're talking about ELA, so I'll, I'll talk about those numbers. Um, just about every grade um, in every school in fourth grade and fifth grade um, with two minor exceptions, um, met the 51 SGP target. So we're seeing, continuing to see some good growth in some schools, some sp spectacular growth, um, particularly um, in the cases of like Bishop and Thompson saw at fourth grade saw some um, pretty impressive growth um, in ELA. Going on to middle school, um, again, we're seeing pretty much um, the same level of proficient and advanced. Um, and the same percentage um, difference between us and the state. Um, and I want to talk about just briefly, I know that we saw an SGP number for grade six um, that was below the target that we would have liked, but still when we look at the percent of proficient and advanced, it's still um, in the same ballpark as we have been before. So while we are concerned, and we'll talk in a minute about what we're going to do to focus in on grade six, and actually we think in, in our analysis of looking at grade six, we saw some um, commonalities in uh, some same areas of concern actually in grade five, even though that didn't show up. Um, but when we looked at the item analysis, saw similar things. Um, and uh, so we still saw a good percentage of proficient and advanced. It just means that those students in those percentages do not grow as much as their peers. Um, again, the same thing for seventh grade. We're consistently above the state. And um, eighth grade, we see um, even a higher number of per percent proficient and advanced compared to, and I just want to kind of go back. So you see that at sixth grade, we are around 84% proficient and advanced. Then when we get to seventh grade, that number goes up to 90%. When we get to uh, eighth grade, that number goes up to about 95%. And when we get to high school, where it becomes a graduation competency exam, um, we're at about 97%. So let's talk a little bit about the growth um, by grade level. So on this chart, the lighter, num the lighter bars are the least amount of growth. So um, it's hard to tell on this chart, but the one, if, I think on your version, the far left is going to look more like yellow, and then the one to the right of that is going to look sort of yellowish green. So anything in the dark, three darker <coughs> shades of green are considered to be moderate or very high growth, and that's where we want to see students. We want to see them at least at the moderate, if not the high and the very high growth. Um, this chart will show you that at, when we look at across all grades, we're showing that the vast majority of our students are following in the, falling in those three colors, and if we look at um, the individual grades, with the exception of grade six, again, the majority of the students are in 
their growth is within those um, top three bands, and that's what we'd be looking for. I don't understand why those don't add up. Rounding. Uh, rounding errors. Hundred. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of the things you'll find if you look at various reports on the state website, some of them must round some ways and some of them <laughs> must round other ways because they're off sometimes by one yeah. percentage point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is there, is there a reason why grade six is so different in terms of least amount of growth comparatively to all the other grades? Do you want to? Uh, well, Deb Perry looked at the sixth grade scores. I actually looked at the elementary scores. We saw some of the same kinds of things. Um, things about really inferencing. It, the questions are different. They're harder. Uh, they're really asking kids not to just go back and do things by rote, but really to think. And I think that's what we're looking at is how do we get kids to learn how to think differently, to really think deeper. Um, so I know that the sixth grade has also just switched to uh, Lucy Calkins writing. Mm -hmm. So there's a consistency across there. Um, one of the things Deb did this year also was have the fifth grade and the sixth grade teachers get together. Mm -hmm. And they talked about what the expectations were at fifth grade, what the expectations were at sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Some of the fifth grade teachers are going to the middle school to actually shadow a fifth grade, a sixth grade student to see what those expectations mm -hmm. are. Um, one of those teachers came back and said, unbelievable, every single class they had them reading, every single class they had them writing. So there was a lot more on-demand reading and writing. She said, I need to, to bulk up that a little bit in fifth grade. So I think those conversations um, are great. It'll help the fifth grade teachers know what mm -hmm. those expectations are and hopefully help in sixth grade. But you, you just mentioned that the sixth grade just started, just started Lucy Conkins. But these children that they that come into the sixth grade, haven't they been doing Lucy Calkins all along? They have been doing Lucy Calkins all so along. It, but last year in sixth grade, they hadn't done Lucy Calkins. So the writing would be different. Mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm saying is when a child goes into the sixth grade, mm -hmm. they've already had Lucy Calkins prior to that several years in the, law, well, in the elementary grade. They haven't had the grade specific ones. So Lucy Calkins used to be a K through two kit and a three through five kit. Arlington has, didn't have the individual grade level kits. They just came out and we're I, just starting those. They're very different. So you, just from my understanding, so because it's a grade level kit, it, it's just not a continuation of the program? It's, it's more geared to, a, so instead of I pick up a book and it says, oh, here's, a, here's an English book that I can use with a second grade kid or I can use it with a kindergartner. That's what the kit was before. I, I understand that, but Lucy Calkins is a process. It's not it's, just dependent on the materials itself. It's writer's itself. workshop process. Mm -hmm. right. it's so, that, so I guess what I'm saying is that process of, of the writer's workshop should be a continuation pro It builds, yes. Okay. And, and I, I'm, just because it's in the sixth grade, it shouldn't be that. Uh, I'll leave it to No, you no. Let me, let me oh, take go ahead. that. that uh, what you're seeing here is the connection between Lucy Calkins writing and Lucy Calkins reading. So what we found in grades five and also found in grade six, and it was very interesting that Evelyn was working with the grade five teachers and Deb Perry was working with the grade six teachers. And when they both reported into me, I'm like, wait a minute, I've heard this before. And this is what we call questions of discernment. So while Lucy, Lucy Calkins is a writing program, the reading program for Lucy Calkins has just started in the elementary schools and was just released for the middle school in August. And it is questions of discernment that we're having trouble with. So so these scores here are not only reflect, reflecting writing, they're reflecting the reading aspect yes, too. Yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. So the disparity that we're talking about in the sixth grade that we're seeing here is because the reading program, these questions that you're talking about, are not, they're not having this, prepar this prior preparation. That's correct. So are you able to differentiate between the writing and the reading aspects of these scores? Yes, we, we get, the scores are broken down by standards so we can see what standards is going So towards. the expectation would be the writing shouldn't see this differentiation as well, much. The, you also have to remember that the Lucy Calkins writing program was phased in over time, so it wasn't until recently that all, and do we this still? Is, this is year two and we still have some units that are Optional. See, so it's your, I think it's your understanding that the whole program was in, um, implemented immediately and it was not. It was phased in over time. All I can remember is that my training in, Lu in Lucy Calkins and the writing aspect, we did not have the reading, I'll admit that, right. 
was something that when it was there, it was just added to, it, it was reinforced each successive year. There were not additional elements every year. There's it was different, support there are, there the are different genres. That there are additional elements, different rubrics, different expectations now for every grade level. So they build more on them. It's just not the writing process then. It's different every year. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to belabor well, this, okay. but. No, so there's Lucy Calkins writing right. workshop, right? And right. there's also a reading component of right. that. Right, but what I'm saying, my question though was, I'll accept that there's a new element in the, in the reading, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's gonna sh show the difference. But the writing scores, mm -hmm. the writing element of this should be consistent. We shouldn't see a, a disparity at the sixth grade in the writing, am I correct? Well, because writing, it has changed a little. So now the units of study are, there's an opinion unit of study. There wasn't always one for every grade level, and it's different at every point. Sixth grade just got those. There's an informational section that's different every year. So it, it's then, kind of. Then I guess this discrepancy, we should, be, we should see this every year then, because the, the prior years are not going to have that new element. The new element is being introduced in the sixth grade. We, we, we introduced them to the other grades as well. Informational writing, which is the core, one of the core I, elements of the Common Core, was not in the original R Lucy Calkins programs. They have recently added the informational writing. Informational writing requires a level of skill in reading. Those two things are very cr right. closely connected that we did not have. So, the, so the, lower, the lower grades, too, should be impacted next year. We will. See, we may see. Well, hopefully not, because hopefully we've gotten ahead of that curve. Okay. 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 Yes. Dr. Kiesi. I just wanted to uh, have Anthony, you emphasize me. again for our viewers at home that this is the first year that this set of tests is the first year that the MCAS was all Common Core related. The percentages of questions has gone up. Yes. Percentage. Yes, it was phased in over time, this. yes. But this is the first year it's all supposed, I mean, it's not going to get more Common Core than this. This was the, I thought. Yeah, I mean, essentially, now we're at a point where all the test questions are aligned to the new standards. Yes, yeah, that, that's yeah. what. If that's, I that's, wasn't that's sure what, what you were asking. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, there was another question. Yeah, um, my, my question is, is if you, when I when I see that pattern in sixth grade, I, I'm I'm seeing two things, and I apologize profusely. I do this for a living, and I, I don't want it to uh, go farther than a well-informed school committee member should, particularly in this forum. Uh, two things I look at: first of all, transition grades for when when they're moving from different building, usually there there is some loss of momentum in that year. And it's something that in Lowell that we're struggling with in our fifth grade, which is our transition year. Uh, so, I, and I was glad to hear that you've got fourth grade teachers going to fifth, you know, fifth grade teachers going to sixth grade and sixth grade teachers going to fifth grade, trying to smooth, uh, keep the momentum up uh, rather than, than losing some there. Have you looked at open response questions vis-a-vis -vis sixth grade relative to other grades and have you found a pattern there we have seen that the open response uh, the sixth grade did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. okay oh, i know matt worked with De deb perry but so i wanted to make specific sure. to ELA right right right, yeah. right i but matt actually helped deb um perry who is the director for um ela work uh, look through this data so i thought perhaps he had some insight that he wanted to share um we have seen, again, any time that the open response question requires the student to go back and make an inference mm -hmm. or to respond which is the best piece of evidence or this, which is the most likely thing to happen, that those are questions where our students are struggling more. Mm -hmm. And you hit on a very important topic, which is the transition year from fifth grade to sixth grade. The amount of scaffolding that a student mm -hmm. has in fifth grade within the classroom is significantly different than the amount of scaffolding that they have within sixth grade currently, mm -hmm. which is why the teachers are vis visiting each other's grades. Students who 
are struggling but able to keep their head above water in fifth mm -hmm. grade because of the scaffolding generally will show a, a slight decline in sixth grade and then mm -hmm. the, as we saw from the scores before we start to see an increase in seventh grade and eighth grade in terms of their performance mm -hmm. what's happening is we've raised the bar for those students because now we're using all the common core the informational text looking at two pieces of text and talking about it and when we raised that bar these students have farther to go to meet that challenge and I think that's some of what we're seeing yeah um, th that that does but this all ties in everybody's got sixth graders because um, the one thing the one thing that we've noticed statistically across the state uh, is that there is an uh, there is an extraordinary correlation between growth scores and open response scores so that a child who is able to articulate learning within the context of an open response question not somebody who's practiced to do it you can't do that but right. somebody who's got the capacity to explain learning is going to do relatively well especially in a response to literature test such as this so uh, that's why I'm sort of alerting to the open response is okay. is an attack point right okay mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. Also, Mr. Uh, Thielman, excuse me. Okay, I just want to go back to the elementary SGP by school, three slides, four slides earlier. Mm -hmm. So the, the one thing I picked up in that mm -hmm. is that there's three fifth grades in the district, Brackett, Dallin, Thompson, that didn't uh, make the SGP goal in mathematics. So is there, so why is that and what's our strategy? Right, we're gonna to get to math and so just. So I, I got ahead of you, okay. <laughs> But we're, we're gonna answer that question when we get all to right. math. All right. <laughs> That's why Mr. Coleman is here. Okay, sorry about that. All He's right. excited that you're excited. So I'm excited to learn to ask this, that question. <laughs> Any more questions about ELA? Yeah. I, sorry. Yes. I, I have a question. Um, so I have a middle schooler, so I get sort of a, a window, but there's a distorted window into what goes on in middle school. So I was wondering, is are the staff in sixth grade newer than they are in seventh and eighth grade so that has been sort of my uneducated perception but that may not be true um, there are, there is a new um, co uh, cluster in sixth right. grade we well, added that's a cluster year, right and we do have an English teacher that I believe is in her second year of teaching as well so last year were there sort of more new people last year than yeah yeah yeah, I, I know that there is one English teacher that's only in her second year of teaching, mm -hmm. and we added a new cluster, but I believe that that teacher had a lot of experience. So I would say of the four teachers, I know for a fact that one of them is in her second year of teaching. Okay. Just curious. Okay. Okay. Mr. Pierce. Building on Mr. Thielman's excellent question, can oh. you help explain for me why the ELA at Stratton and Brackett were lower? Right. Well, what we've done, I've been looking at the exact test items and trying to look at gender and trying to look at uh, the high needs and, and see what the trends are and see what, what kinds of questions they had difficulty with um, at those buildings. They also had a really high amount of kids the year before who did really well too. So trying to discern what that is and actually build teacher competencies and in, in, in instruction is what we're looking at. Um, not to get better at taking this test, but just to get better at thinking and reading and doing the tasks that they need. Um, but we're looking at those questions and we have a lot of data about that and what, and um, uh, what Paul Stickman said is really the open responses we've been looking at, uh, the short and the long open responses. The questions are the same at every school, right? The questions are the okay. same at every right. school. Um, one of the things that uh, she's alluding to is that um, while we knew the 10 things, say um, 10 is not the right number, but just pick a number, the 10 things that we needed to do for the Common Core, um, that's vastly different than knowing how when instructional changes need to have to be made, um, how we have to assess students in a formative way to tell how they're doing, and we're all learning about that, and sometimes we're, and I'm not saying that this is all teacher driven, that's not what I'm intending, to, to make any comment on whatsoever, but schools are growing at different mm -hmm. rates, and so we're seeing some of that. And we're also looking at subgroup groups. In some schools, different subgroups are not um, moving as quickly as we would have uh, we would like, and so we're looking at gender, and, and mm -hmm. um, sometimes that that's a factor, um, and also looking at high need students, and sometimes that's a factor. And if different schools have different percentages of high need students, that's going to that's going to come into play. Um, as I, as I said before, you know, as Ms. Uh, 
somebody asked about the Common Core. Um, th there's just different schools are moving at different paces in terms of the ability to be able to handle that. So, so you know, one of the realities of the, having this kind of data is that, you know, it, it points to the fifth grade at one school or the fourth grade at one school, which is three or four teachers. So I'm assuming that you're using this if isolated where there might be a, an instructor who needs additional help with her practice and yes. you're using that to coach yes. her and guide right. her. And, and it's all about coaching. And yeah. we should also remember that this is one year worth of data. We're not looking right. at a trend over time here. So, you know, one year could be an aberration. I mean, yeah. it could be, you know, for, for whatever reason. So we look at trends over time to really determine whether there is an issue with instruction. Yeah, and we have to be careful not to get into a conversation right. about an individual. Right, into a conversation yeah. about yeah. that, right. So, I want to just say that we look at a lot of data, and yeah. MCAS is just one piece of data that we look at when we look at in terms of what's going on in terms of instruction. Yeah, oh. and I, it might be a him. Cindy, correct me, it could be a her or a him, right? right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The him is probably the one struggling, right? The struggling <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> Uh, this might be actually a good moment because uh, it's related to this question. I'm talking a little bit, just a couple sentences about the lab program that we've put in mm -hmm. place this year, which is an extension on some other pre-professional programs we've had, but is really a significant change this year. Um, so Linda and I both had the opportunity to go to New York um, to Teachers College, and it was wonderful for a coaching institute. And one of the things that we found the most powerful was when we went into a classroom with a teacher who was coaching us in our coaching. So when we came back, we had this idea of wouldn't it be great if teachers could go in and watch other teachers do this mm -hmm. with one of us there to help guide the conversations around this. So we set up a lab program this year um, at every grade level. Teachers who wanted to get involved could sign up for either going in for opinion writing, narrative writing, um, informational writing. They go in once a week um, during that writing block. They stay for 40 minutes. We meet with them before to say what's going to happen and what we're going to be looking for. They follow up protocol while they're in the classroom, whether that's getting involved down and dirty with the kids or it's watching the, the mini lesson and talking about it afterwards. They get to go back to their building. They get to reflect on what they saw and, and they can ask questions of the teacher who led the PD or, or of Linda and I. Um, and it's been kind of an exciting thing. They go for six weeks. They go once a week for six weeks, and they're released from their classroom for that time. We got to move. Thank you. Okay. Uh, where were we? Um, this shows the percentage of students scoring advanced. Again, we have um, approximately at every grade level at least one third of our students, and actually at grade ten that number almost triples, uh, or doubles, uh, more than doubles, um, one third of our students who are scoring um, in the advanced category. When we compare ourselves to the other districts that we always take a look at, um, I showed this chart the last time, but just to reiterate that um, every district that we would compare ourselves to, our level two districts, our percentage of proficient and advanced is pretty much equal to or close to um, all of the districts. As I stated the last time, when I looked across all of these districts over time, I saw that they might go up a point or down a point, a percentage point in terms of their proficient and advanced, but pretty much they're in the same place we are. Yes, sir. Do you look at, I, you're looking at the districts. Do you ever look at the grade levels too in these districts? Uh, we, we look, yes, we look at the individual grade levels. We're pretty much about the same. Everybody's, it, it yeah, if you, it, saw, if you saw the state data, you saw that the state pretty much stayed the same. Everybody's pretty much staying the same. We're all in that position where that last. I guess we, we saw, and I, yep. I'm, I don't mean to dwell on, but grade six for an example, would, you, would there be a I didn't look at that level of detail, okay. but I'm happy to do that and respond yeah, to your I, question. I'll sure. send you an email. Right, it's just something, I mean. That you, that you wonder. Thank you. Yep, sure. Um, f and finally, so at the elementary and the middle school level, as we talked about before, we've seen issues um, in questions of discernment and inference. Um, also, words that have multiple meanings. Uh, one of the questions talked about the bird um, drawing back their wings, um, or the bird drew back his, his or her wings. Um, that was a difficult question for the students to uh, answer because they think see the word drew and they, they ha immediately have one sort of meaning in mind and that wasn't the meaning that was in the question. Um, and so it became difficult for them to answer. Um, skills which relate 
uh, to close reading and high level of reading comprehension are also questions that we have trouble with. Uh, as we talked about, we haven't had an increased enrollment in, student, in students overall, and then that also causes an in, uh, increased enrollment in students that need to have reading services um, for decoding and fluency at the lower levels. So what has happened is that the reading teachers have very limited capacity, almost none actually, to deal with issues of comprehension at grades four and five. Um, we find this across all the ed code districts that we are all looking for that magic bullet that's gonna help us with reading comprehension at grade four and five, which then carries over into grade six. And that's really becoming a, a bigger and bigger struggle over time because of the level of complexity of the text. Um, and student caseload at the middle school for reading teachers allows for no work with comprehension um, except with those students that are, um, at, at, it says level two and three, but it should say tier two and tier three. And Lucy Calk, uh, middle school teachers are just starting training for Lucy Calkins. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that we heard Evelyn talk about the lab program. And it's really our goal, and actually it's the same goal at math, to really get that tier two, one instruction over time to really better meet the needs of all students, and that has a couple of facets to it. It requires personalization and differentiation of instruction, but also um, the tier two, tier one, which is the classroom teacher, needs to be able to mirror a lot of the techniques that are being um, done in tier two and tier three support for those students so that they sort of hear it multiple times and don't see it isolated just into that pullout. Um, that really requires a level of expertise of the classroom teacher to be far and away um, what the expectation might have been two or three years ago. And so the lab program is one way that we're working on that. We have literacy leaders, uh, least literacy lead teachers at every grade level that are running the PD so that we don't have to spread Evelyn and Linda out. Uh, they do that and sometimes even in pairs. Um, we're trying to get a lot of feedback from teachers as to what techniques they're taking away for those. Um, and they'll also be presenting on the uh, full day professional development day. So we, we have put a full court press on this, but as I had said last year, and I guess I, I'm sorry that my words were true, but the road in front of us is much steeper than the road that is behind us. <laughs> so talking about mathematics. Well, can I start, uh, get one last ELA sure. question? What are you guys doing in grade eight uh, in, in ELA? It's spectacular. You're 125% the state average in open response. <laughs> I, I mean, I've been in those classrooms, and I can tell you that the, the teaching is exceptional. Um, I, I don't, I mean, not that all of our teachers aren't exceptional, but those teachers um, actually, uh, several of them went to the Lucy Calkins program and came back as if they had found the keys to the kingdom. So I would, I would say that they, long before those um, materials ever came here, they were this year um, planning to um, implement many of the things that they saw at Lucy Calkins. And if you've never seen Lucy Calkins speak, you need to see her speak because it, it is almost transformative and their experience at Teachers College was, was such. They went last year and in, um, in some in February and some in the summertime. So mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say it's all Lucy Calkins, but I, I definitely think that that inspired them to make a lot of changes this I, year. I mean, certainly it's a, it, it, it marks a high level of discourse that's going on in those classrooms. Yes. Yes. And considering the size of the one classroom that I was in, it was amazing. The teacher was actually to have, be able to have very effective dis discourse with a very full class. She was excellent. Um, so as we look at math, uh, again, over time, we'll see that um, we actually have seen um, a, an increase in the percentage of students who are proficient and advanced, um, and we're seeing a steady increase in our SGP. Um, when we look at the students, a uh, percentage of students in each um, bandwidth, we also see that we're seeing an increase in the percentage of students that are in the advanced category across the district. I'm gonna skip over the accountability slides. Um, we continue to see, um, we made uh, some improvement a couple years ago in uh, grade three, and we continue to see that maintained and see that we're still performing better than the state. Um, we saw some uh, pretty marked improvement in grade four last year um, when the state was pretty flat. Um, pretty much the same in grade five, but still better than the state. Um, at grade six, we're 
see a, continuing to see a positive trend in terms of the um, percentage of students in proficient and advanced. Uh, pretty much the same down a little bit um, in proficient and advanced in grade seven, but still significantly above the state. Um, and also in uh, grade eight above the state and grade 10. So again, I wanna just take you back. If you look at grade six where we are, grade seven goes down a little bit, but then back up in grade eight and then right at the top in grade 10. So we, we end up with 94% of our students at proficient or advanced by the time they graduate. Do we look, Go ahead. do we ever look at a cohort going through on either ELA or math? In other words, we, we, we're looking at these charts and we're seeing a dip from year to year, but they're two different groups yeah. that we're looking at. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, uh, the one thing that's nice about the, the way in which you can generate the reports is you could filter it based on the students that we also own over that period as well. So, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes because we, we also have the data from kids who might move here in ninth grade and then they're tenth graders. So when I look at it, um, I typically, and this is for me, when I look at this, I'm also trying to discern whether or not it's a cohort issue, a curriculum issue, a teacher issue, okay. and sometimes it is a cohort thing. Sometimes you can see that that's a cohort that might be larger in size or has some other deficiencies. So in the overall judgment, I, I want to take that into account. But it, like I said, it's always important for me to filter it as the kids that we own throughout the whole entire time because those are the kids that you know, we, we really have had that effect on long term. It's good, it's good to know that you're looking at all the aspects of the yes. Thank you. We do the same thing at ELA as well. Uh, and if we had infinite amount of time, I actually did that with one cohort and was going to bring it, and then I was just like, that'll be too much. Um, again, we're looking at growth distributions, reminding everybody that the three darkest colors are really where we want to see the vast majority of our students, and we're seeing um, continued good growth um, in math. Again, this chart just shows it in terms of numbers. And then when we compare ourselves to the other districts that we normally compare ourselves to, when we look at our percent proficient in advance within a couple points or equal to. Um, again, these are all level two districts. And if we look at our SGP, it's right in line with all the other districts. Um, I'm gonna actually let Matt talk a little bit about this because I know there was a question about the elementary. Right. Do you wanna cover that question? Yeah, first? I'd like you to, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, it depends on how specific you want. Just uh, as specific as you know, you, you don't think I can understand. You don't think I can. No, 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 no. Well, it's a common. I, it's, I can get well. <laughs> I can blabber. I guess. <laughs> so the three schools were Dallin, I think Brackett, and Thompson. They yeah. they showed the lower SGPs. Yeah. Uh, I would chalk up uh, Dallin fifth grade. Uh, historically, they had been uh, departmentalized, meaning there was only one teacher who taught math. Uh -huh. uh, and last year was the first year where uh, I kind of mandated that all the teachers had to teach math. So uh, the, the achievement was good, but the growth wasn't as good. But you had a couple of teachers who were teaching math for the first time in maybe 10 years. Uh, for Thompson, kind of the cohort analysis, that was a pretty tough cohort. Uh, and historically, they were a little challenging. We've identified some curriculum areas that we could definitely improve upon, uh, but it was a challenging group of kids. Um, and that's not to say all were challenging, but I think there was a subset of the kids that definitely took more time away from teachers. Uh, and that, that has an impact. Uh, for Brackett, at the 47.5, um, I wasn't too concerned because Brackett tends to be a larger school uh, and they have a couple of other programs within there. When I dug a little deeper, the 47.5 as a growth, it wasn't overly concerning. It wasn't as though there was anything that was uh, a huge red flag based on what I saw. It was more a blip. It's one of those things where it's on my radar now to be able to track and see if there is some consistency to it, but that one wasn't really anything that was major or big. Um, for, for seventh grade, uh, they had the 49.5. Uh, they had a couple things. Last year was the first year of implementation of a new curriculum for both sixth and seventh, um, so there's that one little obstacle. Uh, the second thing that was a little bit of a hurdle for the seventh grade, uh, they had a, a larger class. Like there are a couple cohorts that are also much bigger than others. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, you, you guys know how big Odison is in terms of the population. The sixth and eighth grade are pretty big. Uh, that eighth grade current class was with the seventh grade, uh, and that pretty much was a pretty large class. Um, you know, two years ago was the sixth graders, sixth grade teachers who struggled with that that cohort. Um, 
because they are much larger. The typical seventh grade teacher last year had about 125 students overall, whereas the typical eighth grade teacher last year had about 100 and uh, like four, 105. Uh, and last year's sixth grade group was uh, much smaller. I think the total total for last year's sixth grade was only about 351, if I recall correctly. So the, the cohort size and, and that impact on the teachers played a little bit. Um, we did struggle, and this was brought up last year, with balancing some of the sections. So I think some of the seventh grade teachers just had unbalanced sections, new curriculum, uh, larger class sizes overall than they typically have had before. So I think they had a couple things going against them. And what's great to me is they still had the 49.5 SGP. And they still had, uh, if I recall correctly, I think it was a 69 advanced and proficient, which wasn't as far off, relatively speaking, from the state, or it was the same distance from the state as the other grades. So, you know, kind of taking that all into account, um, to me, it wasn't a huge red flag. It was one of those things where I wanted to dig a little deeper into the curriculum. So, you know, with all the grades at the elementary, uh, middle school, we've already kind of looked at some areas we can improve in the curriculum. So I'm. I'm actually optimistic to see how it's going to go with the middle school. Uh, and the high school did great. I mean, the high school I was really excited about. Um, uh, real, real happy about it. But the reality is I think we still have a lot of work to do. And so the, so the takeaway from hearing you is that now you're, you're trying to address some of these concerns in more or less real time to the extent that you can using, is that, or is that possible? Yeah. I mean, now in real time, like the, you know, a daily, so some of Not the things, getting on power school with every student and looking at the data every day, yeah. but I mean, you're able to sort of see if there's trends. Yeah, I mean, that, that's also depend on the local data that we're collecting right now, figuring yeah. out if there, there's anything there. Um, but, but for me, when I think about this MCAS, I mean, we have access to some of the preliminary data in the end of June, which we looked at um, and try to project ahead. I, I see this again in, in August. Uh, and a lot of the things that I think I was already planning for and put in place, I'm hoping fill, fill those voids. Like the, the current sixth grade, is, is large, so having four clusters there is a, is a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the lower end of the current sixth grade it needs and warrants a little bit more support, so we've kind of uh, put some structures in in the current sixth grade right now that will help it out. Uh, in terms of the curriculum issues, you know, we've already been able to have the current eighth grade group, uh, the eighth grade teachers, uh, because they have that cohort from last year in seventh grade, we were able to pull them for a day at the beginning of the year to work on more curriculum things to not only uh, to, to consider the new curriculum, but also to consider what are the, some of the areas of weaknesses we know for the, the kids that just moved up to try to address those within the curriculum that we're working on. So, you know, a lot of this work has already been done, uh, like all kind of setting it up in August and the beginning of September. So real time, yes, but all this stuff, this, the reality is for this, for me, this was a month and a half ago. We talked about one school where, where a group of students were struggling in yeah. fifth grade. Now they're in sixth grade. Yep. So we've identified those students and we've got some plans to help them? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Okay. yeah. We, we kind of beefed up the support program. Um, the, the teacher who's working with them is a fantastic teacher. Um, you know, she has good sized sections. I mean, she's, she's great. She's, she's actually working with kids in her free periods, which is, which is nice. And you know, it's one of those things also for me sharing this information and making this much more transparent and much more accessible to the teachers was, was pretty important to me as well. So, you know, a lot of the teachers in the middle school I kind of worked with to, and kind of pulled reports pretty early just so they were pretty aware. So all the support teachers, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade support teachers have had access to this since the end of um, August as well. And we've really been trying to look at what do we need to do with those students? How do we uh, find some kids that we may have uh, missed the fall through the crack, try to see if we can get them in the support classes, peeling off kids that may not need it, um, working with special ed to make sure that the, that level of instruction for the, the small group math classes are pretty good. Uh, currently, all the um, small group math classes are actually co-taught with a special educator, someone who self-identifies with math, as well as a support teacher. So there's two teachers in there, which is kind of nice. And some of those kids are the, the kids you know who are traditionally, typically scoring on the lower end. So we're trying to, you know, what I was trying to do was just build all that infrastructure and that support in the front end, so it's not us reacting, it's, it's already there. Um, and ho I'm hopeful that it's gonna help out. Thank you. Um, the only other comments that I wanna make here is that one of the things that we did was that we did um, get two additional math coaches this year, so level two schools 
um, last year were sharing uh, math coaches. They now have their own math coach. Um, and coaches are uh, focused on assisting students in those instructional changes. Um, the other thing that Matt alluded to is that we have really opened up what's called Edwin Analytics, which is a tool provided by the state um, to all the teachers uh, across the district so that they really can look at all of, the, so they're not just looking at their students, but they're looking at, say, all the students in fourth grade or all the students in seventh grade. Um, and teachers have been working together at, on di with data, not just at the elementary, although that has been quite the focus, but also at the middle school um, and uh, looking, looking at that data, which is, I think, is going to make a big improvement for us. Science and technology. Uh, uh, oh, back, sorry. back to man. <laughs> nah. Before, before we, uh, Again, what are you doing up in eighth grade that's so wonderful? Um, it's a set of teachers that work until 7 o'clock at night, and they're unbelievably dedicated. They're, they're great. I mean, if you ever talk to an eighth grade math teacher, uh, tell them to take a day off. Um, I mean, really, they, they're, um, they work hard. Uh, they really do. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, is that uh, you know, we, we're, we're used to talking about exemplaries in the elementary, and the high school results this year are sterling. But uh, the eighth grade scores in both ELA and math, uh, the growth scores indicate high open response, which, you know, the thing is, we're not talking about learning how to take a test. And, and, and the open response kind of questions are the ones that indicate the ability to think and, 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 and express learning. So it washes out a lot of the teaching, the test. It's just a measure of good teaching. And when, when I see those numbers are consistently high, I know something good's happening, which is why I want to make note to everybody that this eighth grade uh, last year did extraordinarily well as a, as a cohort. Uh, and, and just sort of put that on the table as something that should spread around the rest of the district uh, is, wonderful, is, an, is an example of wonderfulness. The other question I'm gonna have is you raised the point of, of the class sizes in seventh grade last year, and that's where we had that class of like 36, 37 37. kids? Yeah, 36. 36. Are, 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 do we have any similar concerns this year of any individual classes that are starting to look, uh, look large that we should know about? Not, not in math. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, I, I, uh, Maureen Murphy, one of the vice principals at Audison, um, I'm sure at some point uh, at the end of the summer wanted to kill me with the amount of emails that I was sending her. Um, we were pretty much on top of all the math numbers. Um, the, some of the comments from some of the seventh grade math teachers, and, and really kind of extends, but the seventh grade math teachers in particular said that it was, uh, the classes are more well, they're much more balanced this year than they've ever had it. Um, the class sizes are pretty much, uh, you know, pretty normal. But the one thing to take into account is that the current seventh grade also has a more reasonable overall class size. It's only 350 kids as opposed to the other two. So they were working with 380 kids last year. You know, the reduction gives much more flexibility with the balancing. If you look at eighth grade classes this year, they are a little bit bigger, um, but it's not unmanageable. It's not unreasonable. Um, it's, 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 you know, we try to take some of that balancing into account. Mm -hmm. I was alluding to the, um, uh, the support teachers. Mm -hmm. So the support teachers for me provide a lot of flexibility in what I can do. So to, to add increased um, kind of reservoir of teaching, one of the, the eighth grade support teacher also has a section, a normal section of math. Mm -hmm. To you know, the typical grade has 15 sections of math in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. It has 16. Um, to to just allow for the fact that it was a larger overall class size and to, to provide a little bit more balancing. One of the difficulties last year was how do you split up the, cult, the, the clusters to be able to balance it? Mm -hmm. And by adding that extra section of Math 8, it, it allows you just to kind of move things around mm -hmm. and, and work the jigsaw much more thoughtfully. And the four clusters in sixth grade, it's, it's gold. You know, the, the typical teacher has about 100 kids. Mm -hmm. And you kind of alluded to the transition year. Mm -hmm. To me, that's so important. It, it's, even though it's the, smaller, it's the smallest average for a, a cluster teacher to have, it's probably one of the more important because you're working with so many other issues than just academics, new environments, new cultures. So that's, it seems to be a pretty good place to put your, your, your eggs right now. Uh, on top of the fact that, you know, that, that sixth grade from a math point of view, and I'm a little biased, um, that's already a class that, are, that, that I wanna make sure there's a little bit of a focus on long term. I think they can use a little bit of support. Thank you, very thoughtful response. Okay. 
Um, going on to science and technology, um, we did see a, a decline, a little bit of a decline this year. Um, when we looked at those questions, we do not believe it is content. We believe that it is the level of reading that we're asking our, and writing that we're asking our students to do and the content area. And this also showed up in ELA. So we were actually, the two corollaries did not surprise us. Um, pretty much stable for uh, science. Um, we did find that there was an area of communication technology that had been dropped out of the curriculum and in the engineering and technology curriculum um, because of lack of time and they've rearranged some stuff to put that back in there. It's only one or two questions, but it means that that strand for some reason has, a, has an impact. Um, we're still significantly above the state. Um, and then again, um, when we look at the percentage of proficient advanced, um, in uh, science at grade 10, again, significantly above the state. Um, so in terms of the science analysis, um, as I said, we saw some problems with communication engineering and that has been um, rectified and so those low scores um, should come up in that, that one strand. Um, in, in addition, the level of complexity, we're, we're seeing it at grade five, but it, also, we noticed at grade eight that the questions that the students were struggling again were with um, complex task text, and the level of writing that they're being asked to do is much more significant. Um, just quickly going over our high need students, and this is again the definition of students who fall into those groups. When we look at this, the percentage of students that um, reach proficiency, so the uh, all is the white, which would be all of our students. The darker color purple is the non-high need students, again, students who don't have an IEP or don't have ELL, are not ELL students or are not free and reduced lunch students. And the lighter blue color um, is uh, the high need students. And even though um, there is a difference, you'll see that there is consistently as we look over the grades, as students move up through the grades, um, a higher and higher percentage of students in the high needs population um, reaches proficiency. Um, while we do see a challenge still at math, it, it kind of fluctuates a little bit in the elementary school. Again, when you look at um, grades 7, 8, and then 10, you see a consistently rising percentage of the students that are reaching proficiency in the high needs population. However, that is an area that we continue to focus on. And as we talk about improving uh, tier one instruction, um, in ELA, we also feel the same thing in math. And so that is what, what our coaches are working on. So what lies ahead for us um, through um, arrangement of the budget this year, we have three building subs that go around to each team, um, elementary school. And so we have, we call them data teams. Uh, one of the meetings uh, over a two month period will be a response to intervention data team um, that will look at those students who need intervention. But the other uh, times that they meet, Teachers are free to choose the area of, that they would like to work on, and that part of that work includes looking at data in that area. And so um, that will be, I know also that we have um, Paula O'Sullivan who joined us this year, um, who had worked with DSAC at the state, and she's been working with a lot of the level two schools to work on their data. Um, and we're also looking at data across the board, not just DRA data, which is what we had um, used to have done. Baseline Edge, we have a lot more of our data in Baseline Edge. Teachers, when they do DRA testing and when they do um, writing assessments and math assessments for grades three through five, they're immediately putting their data into Baseline Edge so that that's a formative assessment so they can monitor that over time. Along with their MCAS data is also in there so they can ask a question like, which of the students who failed this formative assessment also didn't um, pass the MCAS test or scored poorly on the MCAS test, they can ask that information. They can also isolate which of these students are special education, et cetera, to um, take a look at that data. Um, we also are having a wider review at all levels of common assessment data. As you knew, last year we put in um, a win block or a flex block. Um, and the literacy coaches and the math coaches at the elementary level, um, we've actually scheduled the building subs so that they can be in those buildings when the literacy coach and the math coach is in that building so that when they, those teachers meet, they have that assistance available to them. And um, we will continue uh, as part of the new teacher evaluation system to set up specific goals and, um, at schools and teacher goals to target student achievement. I've got a question on the last one for you. How do you differentiate from teacher A and teacher B with teacher A student, teacher B student. In other words, the achievement 
Mr. Thielman has high achievers or a percentage that do really well, and Mr. Hainer doesn't. Yet we have similar goals, and my my achievement isn't as high. Yeah, I, I, well, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have the same goal. First of all, we try to um, avoid a, a black or white quantification of what that goal should be, um, and that we're more looking for growth of students over time. So. If Mr. Hainer was a special education teacher and Mr. Thaleman had all the honor students, they would equally have a growth that we would have expected of those students, but the the um, the black and white number might not be the same. Uh, I, 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 it's my poor articulation and my bad example. Uh, the there are so many variables mm -hmm. that determine growth. You, you you've our expectations of you, and you've been able to articulate the different variables that have skewed some of the scores that we were expecting. That must be an awful hard thing for an evaluator to be uh, communicating to the teacher. When we, as, long, as long as it's out there and we, we're discussing no, I, it, I, I think it's important. No, I think that's important. important. We, when we teachers set goals, at the, we tell them straight out that what we're not looking for is whether you met that goal, you're great, you didn't meet that goal, you're lousy. What we're looking for is how you made progress towards that goal, and if you had problems meeting that goal, why did you meet those problems? What are all the variables that we took into place? Thank um, you. It's, it's a, a definitely a collaborative conversation between the evaluator and the teacher. Great. Thank you. So I, I have a question. I, it's hard for me to sometimes to look at these charts because we have this state average that can sometimes be quite low or quite high. For example, looking at science, um, uh, eighth grade science is 42 for the state average of proficient and advanced, mm -hmm. whereas 10th grade for the state is 71. Mm -hmm. So are we really doing Maybe we're really doing much, much better in eighth grade than we are in the tenth grade. What you're really looking for is, is the, the difference the between difference, them. Right. And um, so, right. So the question is: um, is it is it just variabilities in this test that or why some grades score higher? Um, it becomes a graduation requirement in grade ten. So it gets um, easier. And, uh, well, it looks a little bit like it might get easier. It is the, more achievable. Mm -hmm, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, but also the seriousness of which students. Uh, and the, also the bandwidth of what students are being tested on because mm -hmm. all of our students take um, an intro, we call it physics, but it's an intro lev level to physical science class and then that's the MCAS test that they take. Mm -hmm. They're all taking the exact same course where in eighth grade you're testing the science was, that was taught in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So you're teaching, you're, and in fifth grade, even worse, you're testing the science that was covered in first grade, second grade, mm -hmm. third grade, and fourth grade, and fifth grade. So it's a much, um, um, narrower amount of information that's covered. So that's, that's partly so easy, that's why it's easier to play to there. Okay. 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 My question actually kind of gets to what Masseuse was talking about. Um, I'm wondering, I appreciate that our achievement has been gradually increasing over time and is actually quite high compared to the state. And I'm wondering if we're at the point where we should start looking, separating out the advance from the proficient, not just clumping them together and looking at one line, but doing like a stack graph um, going across to see how, you know, ideally you'd see the number, the whole number going up and the, the advance increasing over time. And, but I feel like there's some more information that could be gotten from analyzing. Sure. So you like want that. us to look at the percent of students that are advanced at the state level as well as the, uh, compared to the district level? Is that what I'm hearing I'm, you say? I'm thinking you could do the same. I'm not sure how to present the state data yet. Right. Um, but just do the same information, but instead have it the percent proficient below, and then you stack the percent advanced on top of that, so that the top line will will mimic what you've yeah. got. Right. I I think that's this, for the, 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 this is I'm, what. Um, no, no. I want I want them on top of each other, so you can. So you want a stacked graph as opposed yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. Um, like this one. Or this one. I know I have it. One in here someplace. Yeah, it goes across. I'm trying to find it. Yeah. It's in here somewhere. Remember, right. So instead of that, you'd like it stacked. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can certainly do that. Because I'm thinking, you know, it, I'd like it's to It's vi visually I, easier it's to see? It's visually easier to see, and, and it means something different to me if I see the advance doing this versus if I see it widening. You know, I'd like to see everyone yep, going sure. up we can, and getting... I can, it, that's easy to do. Um, easy enough to do. And, yeah. I don't know if that's available at the state level. Okay. I they don't. They don't they give you just proficient they don't, they don't bring it somewhere. Down. 
No, I'll have yeah. to do it by hand, but that's yeah. okay. okay. I, I, this, this is easy. We just change this. When we that's run right. this, we just change it for a stacked bar as opposed to a side-by-side um, -side bar. Uh, all the wonderful work you're doing to compensate for all the issues on MCAS, is it translatable to the new potential testing system, or are you going to have to start all over again? Um, I, I'm going to let you answer. <laughs> What I would say is we're at the point right now where, uh, not to say I don't worry about MCAS, but it's not like I'm talking about increasing MCAS scores. Like I wouldn't be talking about increasing okay. park scores. What I want to talk about is, in, in, is increasing our capacity to be better teachers. Right. And that's the part that's going to translate. So I, I don't know if it's, it's not just as simple as like changing it. I, 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 the fish that I have to fry are more instructional and they're more curriculum based. So it's, right. and I think that's, that's what's going to help. That's great. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, no, Wait. go ahead. No. Mr. Okay. Schlickman I'm, first, though. He, he was oh. waving at me, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think you're absolutely right. Is that uh, one of the misconceptions we have is we're chasing test scores, and we're not. At least that's not our intent uh, on the committee. But we're aware that certain indicators within the test are highly correlated to high-quality instruction and, 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 and student achievement. The, the MCAS is nothing more than an indicator in a constellation of sub-indicators. And if you look at the indicators carefully, you can pick out the ones that, have, that, that correlate to excellence in instruction. And, and, and benchmark that. You can look for trends. You, you can see certain things. So being uh, data aware and looking at this as much the way you described is very important, but it's not how many kids were proficient this year versus last year. It's not a lot of the metrics that get published in the newspaper. It's that subtle analysis of the subscores that, that have relationship to things that you're doing in the classroom that you translate into the next year's strategy to, to improve instruction next year. Because the, the two things we're saying, one, you were talking about coaching. I, I firmly believe every teacher deserves a coach. I mean, Tom Brady's got a coach. Why shouldn't our teachers? Um, and secondly, um, you know, th th there are things that, th there are a couple things that call out to us. And I'm looking at some of the high need students uh, on, on the elementary in some buildings and saying, uh, you know, that, that, that's of concern, and I know it's a concern of yours, and I know you're, you're working on it. But I'm also seeing some, some, some amazing things that, that I can discern from the patterns. And, and, and I've got to say that the uh, people of Arlington are well served by, by the school system, and, and, and there's obviously a commitment to high level uh, teaching going on uh, all over the place. Dr. Ampey. <laughs> I'm just following up on what you said about park. Um, oh, we're going I, back to that one. Uh oh, <laughs> I didn't use that word. It, so yard, I understand that park. we're not doing that. We're doing MCAS again this year, but if in the future we go to park, um, because the state does, I understand that they're not releasing individual questions. So how can you drill back um, difficulties with? In, in areas with students. Okay, before, I, I'm gonna let Matt address that question, but I just want, I don't want anyone at home to think that while we are not doing PARC this spring that we are sort of just sitting back and letting the world pass us by. Right. Um, we actually have a committee uh, of representatives of teachers across the district um, that will begin meeting, that have met with me once, but will begin meeting with me again in January, where we will um, talk about what we feel is necessary to prepare the district to do park should that school, um, the Massachusetts Board of Education uh, vote to go with park. So I just want to assure people at home that we're not, just because we're not going to be doing it in the spring, that we're just not doing anything. But do you want to talk about? So you're talking about how do you do an analysis if we don't have the questions that are released? So the one thing I'm not quite sure about, and this is what I'm trying to think about, is whether or not that's a long-term mandate. Because I don't, I don't, at some point, right now also for the MCAS, they're only releasing half the questions. Mm -hmm. So when we do, we do analysis, it's sometimes frustrating because you can only see 
you know, the, the domain or the standard. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point, maybe two or three years down the road, when it's more established assessment and they've normed everything, that they will start to release some of the assessment, uh, the questions, as well as some student work uh, that usually comes at some point. Um, I just don't know if there's a timeline. But I, I, yeah, I am aware of the fact that it's not released immediately. But I'm, yeah, that, that could add a little wrinkle at the beginning. OK, um, thank you. But, but what, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman? Yes. But what you're really doing is you're not, a, a good analysis isn't looking at a question and trying to, to think out what happened to that question. Because you can have some real spurious things going on with any given question. Uh, every question's full of error. The more you group together, the less error you have, the more you've got to deal with. What, what happens is, is that we, look at clusters of questions and see how that correlates to other things that we're doing. And, and this is the point we were making on the open response. As the open response tends to move, it, it tends to be aligned with things that we like to see in the classroom. Or as certain components of the test moves, you're, you're seeing in classes with higher levels on, on certain subscores, you're seeing as a trained observer, more in instances of higher order th uh, lessons going on in the classroom. So you can see the numbers or indicators of, cl of classroom performance. And that's how you line it up. I mean, uh, what, what, why is standard 12 or under the new uh, uh, standards, why are certain areas of interest? Well, maybe they're not. But if you see that one is lower than the other, or, you know, you, you can start to think that out. But it's, it's, it's really not that necessary if the content area standards are, are clear and you're teaching to the standards and uh, that th you don't need the, the, the list of test questions in order to think about what, what, what this means. Um, the last thing I want to say is one of the reasons I invited um, uh, both of these uh, colleagues to come tonight is that I want you to get the sense and the, the folks at home to get the sense that we work together as a team so that even though we don't we have many times we'll meet and the social studies there is no MCAS for social studies but there are standards in the Common Core State standards that talk about literacy that r relate to social studies and even though science has its own content area there are also literacy standards that um, appear in science um, we meet as a team we analyze student data and performance together as a team and we put together plans together as a team um, to uh, educate the whole child and I think that that's mm -hmm. the important thing that I wanted you to get out of tonight because as someone had said in the beginning it's really the instruction when you get to 80 percent 85 percent proficient in advance the difference between that and meeting all of your goals for all students whether it be MCAS or otherwise is just going to be a change in instruction and it takes a full court press to make a change in instruction it's just an incredibly high mm -hmm. bar. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank everything you. you've done. Thanks. <clears throat> Great job. Excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Bodie, school safety. And do you want to invite I, I also, yes, yeah, so I'll invite uh, Cindy Sheridan Curran to join us. And, and I also want to thank them. That was a terrific presentation. But I also think that you can hear the, the level of thought and planning mm -hmm. that goes in in response to these tests, as well as all of our formative assessments. All right. <clears throat> One of um, our sort of collective district goals this year is to um, Relook, update all of our safety protocols, mm -hmm. um, which include some of our um, protocols around evacuation. And we have been, we have, we have spent over the years, and I, I want to give again a historical context to this. We have actually done quite a bit of work in the past uh, five, six, seven years in in uh, improving the protocols we have around safety in our buildings. Some of these have been even triggered by events in the nation that we've all um, have found quite tragic. Mm -hmm. And, but as we, but it's, it's a, this year we're having a particular focus uh, in part in response to the governor's uh, task force recommendations this summer, um, but also some initiatives around safety that 
uh, our, our police department as well as our larger community uh, of STARS community members um, are, are highly recommending to school districts. And last, last school committee meeting, so the public is aware of this, um, the school committee in executive session, because it's an item for, sec, uh, for executive session, um, had a presentation from our chief of police, uh, Chief Ryan, um, uh, Sergeant Gallagher, and uh, uh, Cindy Curran around uh, recommendations for a change in some of our one of our proto some of our protocols this year. And well, we're not going to have the full presentation this evening. Um, I've asked Cindy if she would come and just sort of give a quick overview and then talk about where, what we need to do to move forward um, in the rollout of this. Cindy? Okay. I'd like to just um, first acknowledge the fact that what we're presently practicing is a passive response to a um, dangerous intruder situation um, that is via our lockdown drills. And we would like to move toward a proactive response, um, mostly because of some very powerful recommendations and some um, lessons learned from some really tragic events. Um, the Department of Homeland and Security recommendations um, a few years ago um, was their three outs program, the get out, hide out, take out, um, which is really reflects our natural human response to an unsafe situation, which is, of course, fight, flight, or freeze. Um, moving forward, um, this past summer when the um, task force uh, from the Governor's Council on um, School Safety and Security came out, that report really mirrored a lot of what we are already doing in Arlington and, and we're already doing much of it very well. Um, but again, a recommendation was made to move away from the passive response to a more proactive response. Um, in June 2013, the U.S. Department of Education, the REMS, Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools, recommended that, uh, recommended that we stop using lockdowns as our only school response. Um, so because the um, Governor's Task Force very specifically cited the ALICE program, um, the three of us in the community who are trained ALICE um, responders, that would be, of course, um, Inspector Porcello, our school resource officer, Sergeant Gallagher, and myself. So we would really like to move toward the implementation of ALICE. Uh, very quickly, ALICE is not a linear response, um, but a list of options and tools that we would like to practice with our staff and students so that they have a, an ability to respond in a varied way to a certain set of circumstances. Um, so very briefly, ALICE stands for, um, the A is for alert, which of course is to notify authority, authorities and anyone who may be in harm's way from a violent intruder. Um, and what they'd like to see is that anybody would be authorized to make this announcement um, and to make the notification and that we not use any codes. So we would use very clear language about the danger and about the um, presence and identification of the intruder. The L is, of course, for lockdown, which is presently practiced in, again, a very passive way. So the difference here is that the um, barricade training um, would go into effect, um, which is, in essence, learning to not just hide and, and be silent in the classroom as presently practiced, but learn how to barricade the door so it would make it more difficult for an intruder to breach that door. Um, inform the use of, of course, technology to provide real-time updates and information as the event is occurring. Um, the counter is to interrupt the skill set needed to shoot accurately. This, of course, is a very, very last response if an intruder should breach um, an area where we have students or staff. Um, and, of course, the E is for evacuate, um, and that is, of course, to get away to put time and distance between, um, you know, that staff or student and the danger. Um, again, this is not a linear response, but a set of really common sense tools that we would like to practice. Um, and, again, the recommendations are very clear from um, our federal government down to our um, district levels that we move in this direction. Um, so we would like to and are ready to move forward with your approval. I'm going to put the motion on the table so we can debate Already it. Ahead. So I'll move that the uh, school district adopt the ALICE uh, training. School safety protocol. School, school safety protocol. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's open for discussion at this time. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that uh, working in Lowell, uh, we're uh, a few months ahead of Arlington in this, and we've done the initial training. Uh, I don't want to go into details here at the meeting because I think that uh, 
as we go forward, uh, the police department's going to go out with, with the school department and talk to parents about what this is all about. But it's an excellent program. It's very well thought out. The, the training that we've received is school administrators in Lowell has been top rate. Uh, and, and I think that it's, this is an important step forward to maintaining safety in our buildings. Great. Anyone else like Mr. Thielman? I thought Jennifer had her hand up. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no, I had these general questions, but tell me when it's sort of appropriate to, to ask. Go right ahead. Them. They're mm -hmm. not about LSO, so mm. oh. I, can, I can wait. Okay. Then let's stay with LSO. So I, you know, the one thing I want to say is, you know, Chief Ryan is, has recommended this strongly. He was with us in executive session. The public should know that. So the, the, the police department, the superintendent, the leadership of the district, all the people that are involved in safety in the district are recommending this. Uh, and so that makes me very comfortable with it. Plus, it's, it's, it's being used in many other districts. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to add to that that we did have a very detailed discussion at yeah. that time. So the question, we're not asking a lot of questions right now because we had a long, detailed mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, at our last meeting. Dr. Bodie. Um, I can go a little bit over the rollout of this at, uh, pending your approval this evening that we've actually spent mm -hmm. a lot of time thinking through and have investigated the, investigated how it has been rolled out in other districts. Um, other districts have moved further, than, uh, have done this as well. I, I don't, we, we know quite a few districts around here have already gone through the training. Karen, do you have the, um, can you put that up so everybody can see it as I talk about it? And Cindy, feel free to add any comments you might want to make about this. I'm just going to go over the brief structure of it. Do you want us to take the vote first um, and then? Yep. No, I think you should go through it first before we take the vote, yeah. So the, 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 first, mm -hmm. the first step really was in September, it ended up being more, um, small oh wait a minute you have doesn't matter we have it mm -hmm. we have it here but the, the wrong I know but you know what I, I think I gave you the, that's my fault I gave I gave you didn't give you the updated let me just take that off the screen and I'll just okay. talk about it okay. and because we'll have we'll put the corrected one with, with that that adapts to we had to change some of the dates because we weren't ready to present to the school committee in September um, but let me just talk about what this will look like. So pending your um, approval, um, what the next step of this will be is that we will have an overview at all of the school's faculty meetings. Mm -hmm. So all staff in all the schools will have an overview of ALICE and the program. Um, this will occur in November and December. We've already scheduled the elementary, which would be in early December. We're still in the process of scheduling the middle school and the high school <coughs> for when this presentation is going to occur. So that, that's, that's the next big step. So these are sort of in big windows of, um, of time. The next is that um, we need to have a town-wide uh, presentation to parents. Mm -hmm. And that will occur in the January, February. We're actually working on some dates right now and, uh, and potential speakers at that. So that will, that will be a winter. And we'll certainly give plenty of notice to parents for those presentations. We will then move into training. This year, we have decided that it makes sense to have, as, as Cindy pointed out, that this is really, we're, we're asking to practice this. So in this rollout this year, we're going to have the high school, the middle school, and one of our elementary, and, the, and that, that school will be Bishop. Mm -hmm. um, so what will happen when we get into the, the February, March time period, because we need some windows in order to accomplish this, we will have, um, the training for the staff in those buildings. All right. Then, as we go further in this, we're getting ready to do the practice with the goal that we're actually going to practice this in June. We will, we will have a practice session for parents at each level so they can come in and experience exactly what their children will experience. And that will be scheduled probably late May, early June. And then we're, the goal is by, the end, by June, 
middle June is to have the actual practice with those three schools. Uh, obviously, they won't be sort of staggered a little bit. And then we'll be debriefing. After each one, we'll have a debriefing session. So based on what we learn, particularly what we learn doing this with Bishop, will inform how we do the, the training next year for the other elementary schools and we'll follow the same course of action. There'll be a training at each school followed by parents having a chance to experience what, what, the, what the practice session, what the, um, the uh, exercise looks like and then we'll do the practice at each of the schools so that by probably November next year we will have done all of the training for the district. So that's the rough guideline. We can put this um, up in our <coughs> notes. But I, I guess I gave you, what I gave you was the initial copy that we had and I didn't, I somehow quickly gave it to Karen too quickly. But we do have it thought out based on when we actually were able to do the executive session presentation to the school committee, okay? Okay, um, at this time I'd ask Ms. Fitzgerald, do you have a motion for us to electronically vote, or are we going to do it manually? No, manually. manually. Uh, all those in favor uh, of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Thank you. It's <coughs> unanimous pass. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Kern. Thank you. We have a member, two people ask okay. questions. Ms. Seuss. Oh, um, I, have, I have some question, general questions um, because I had a chance to read the governor's task force recommendation and they're partly related to Alice. I understand Alice is, um, everyone's being trained, you know, all teachers, students are involved and it's designed to empower lots of different people. Um, but one of the very strongest recommendations from the governor's task force, which may be being implemented, I just don't know, is to identify a school level crisis response team that work, that meets regularly. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that is part of this process or? It is actually is when separate? we had, <coughs> yes, as, as Cindy was saying, we, we actually do almost, I, I would say that we do what is in the, in the task force. And one of the reasons we have been able to have that level of preparedness is that a number of years ago it was in 07, we got, we applied for a, the REMS grant through the federal government. We received it, it was nearly $100,000. And during, and during that period of time, which extended over, well, we took us about two years, we did a lot of training. We, we have a crisis uh, communication and management booklet, handbook, which actually details um, what, who should be on the crisis team, what the responsibilities of the crisis team are, and all the principals have this. So we've been reviewing that with principals this year. Um, and all of the principals are, if they haven't already created the crisis teams this year, we'll be creating the crisis okay. teams. So at each school, there's an identified group of people yes. that are, and how often do they meet? Um, there's a, there's a district-wide meeting on anybody who's involved in the crisis team mm -hmm. monthly. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some elementary schools that are now starting to have monthly meetings within the building. Okay, but that's <coughs> just being rolled out with the expectation that we will do that overall? Most of the buildings are already doing that. Okay. So th this is a process that's been in place. Okay. Um, and, you know, we've got some new staff, and, and we've just recently now we have social workers in every building. Mm -hmm. So um, this is something that for the most part is, is being done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually one other question I had. Um, Another strong recommendation of the task force is to have this anonymous hotline. I know one of the things you mentioned in your r report last time is that in many cases, somebody knows that there's something very dangerous about to happen, mm -hmm. but that information doesn't filter out properly. Um, do we have anything like that in place or any plans for we don't, an anonymous We don't really have a hotline, but that I did see that in the report, and that is something that we're talking about okay. how to put that in place. What um, I think what happens is that it go, it, it's very important that students feel a connection to at least one person in the building because that's often who they will go to. Mm -hmm. right. um, I don't. I'm not saying that the hotline wouldn't be important. It is, but uh, I think our our first. And I think the most important thing that we do is to make sure that one, we're aware, uh, we're, we're, we're very aware of the students in each building. Mm -hmm. 
and that we create a way that students have a, a strong connection mm -hmm. to someone in that building because that is, I think, important. Mm -hmm. And we do, and to add to that, we do have student support teams. So mm -hmm. there's, there's really a vehicle in each building um, that all staff members have to kind of run through any concerns about a particular student. Um, so there, there are already um, we, processes that, mm -hmm. in place in each building specifically to address students who are at higher risk or um, any students that are flying <coughs> underneath the radar and um, we have staff members who do have concerns. Mm -hmm. And those meetings are weekly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th this is a question for the superintendent. Um, on the rollout sheet that needs to be updated, it does talk about early on a notification of the rollout to parents and staff. And I'm wondering, is that going to still happen? And yes. how is that happening? And what's the process? Yes, there will be um, a letter that's sent out to, I was just giving you the broad, yes, there will be a letter that will be sent out before we actually begin these trainings. And, and, and accompanying that will be the general role out of it. Um, supporting documentation is about this. So we'll create some URLs that we can have parents go look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, we have to do that before right. the trainings actually start in the schools. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. That was my question. Good job. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate that. You have two minutes? No. <laughs> Superintendent's report. I ran over. <coughs> we have the motions on lab. Yes, I guess we are a little off um, mm -hmm. time. Well, as you know, we belong to two collaboratives, um, the EDCO Collaborative for uh, professional development primarily and job-alike professional development as well as some special ed. But our primary collaborative for special education is the Lab Collaborative. And we've talked, I think you're all very familiar with that collaborative. Um, over the last few years, just the new regulations apply to all collaboratives special ed, professional, whatever, the, whatever the, um, their mission is. And, and quite recently this year, you approved the Articles Agreement for EDCO, and um, I'm asking you this evening to, uh, to approve the Articles of Agreement for LAB. Those, the articles have been discussed at great length with the five members of the LAB board, which consists of the five superintendents of the, of the five districts represented in LAB, and we've gone through multiple readings of it. We've had the attorney for the lab collaborative review it. Review it. The, the articles are totally consistent with all the regulations that have been um, uh, required by Department of Education. So we, the, um, what is going on right now is that all of the lab districts or super, uh, school committees are being asked to approve the articles. Once that has been accomplished, then the, the um, articles go to the Department of Education for final approval. So I move approval. Well, we have two motions here. Let's, I, so I move approval of the lab. So yeah, the second one is to have you um, sign it. Right, the first one. Any questions? Is there a second? Yes. Is there any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, so I move to authorize the chair of the school committee, Mr. Hainer, to sign the collaborative agreement with Lab Education Collaborative. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the, do you want to make, the EDCO uh, agreement, we were going to have it signed. This, they still have to do some fine tuning and get it approved by their board first before we vote on it. There was a, an amendment brought forward by one of the uh, members. So they're working on that. Yeah, well, so we'll be bringing that forward to you next, next meeting. Cause okay. the, because the EDCO board of directors has to vote on the amendment before it comes to school committees. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Karen, could you put up that little um, video get, or get it ready? What you're going to see, and I had wanted to, to do this last week, we prepared and just sort of we're tight for time. But I wanted to be able to show you this little clip. One of the things that, um, is, as you know, we, we are part of the Middlesex, the district attorney's Middlesex oh. League. All right, well, sorry. We'll just, let me explain what's going on. 
And there is a Middlesex Partners for Youth was something that was started years ago actually by, um, it's been in existence for a long time actually, um, in, in the Middlesex DA's office. But one of the things that they have done in the last couple of years is do um, <coughs> outreach to students both um, in terms of creating posters on a particular theme or pub in the last couple of years, public service mm -hmm. announcements that are usually go for 60 minutes, or I mean, I'm sorry, 60, 60 seconds. seconds. It's not 60 minutes. And they open this up to all of the communities in the Middlesex district. Um, and this, this last year, I think that there were 130 students who participated and there were 33 student videos submitted. And um, Odyssey Middle School submitted um, one, of the, one of the videos and the theme was take time to get involved. And this year we have another one which is another theme. But there mm -hmm. were five winners selected. And how the, how the balloting occurs is that there's the first winnowing down to a number of um, videos. And then the videos are sent out to all member schools who are willing to do judging. Uh, we had to decline this year because one of ours was a finalist. But we've done it in the past. And so the final five are selected by other students. Hmm. Of the five that were winners, only one was a middle school, and that was Odyssey Middle School. And I want to really recognize Edith Moissant, who um, works with our students in just an amazingly wonderful way, is very creative, and she has a group of students that do a lot of work with video. As you know, they have the ACMI studio there at Odyssey. And so I just wanted to show you what the video was on this theme. Um, this was shown to, we had a, a, a couple weeks ago, a breakfast for superintendents and police chiefs, and all the videos were shown at that time. Mm -hmm. and so again, the theme is take time to get involved. Nice. Congratulations to to that team of students and to um, the whole the whole Odyssey Middle School and certainly and great gratitude to Eden Moisan for her leadership and so they're anxious to do it again this year so we'll see how they do um, and uh, then the one thing I, I just wanted to give you an update um, today well everybody was aware of how. Mm -hmm significant last night's storm was. We weathered it fairly well compared to some districts, though this morning there was no electricity at Town Hall, and for some reason the phone system for all of our elementary schools was out for, in some places, for a good portion of the day. Um, alert nows were sent to all parents. We did have some damage, but nothing really, uh, really significant, though here at the high school, for the I don't think I've ever called this happening in a big storm before, but the blue gym, about half the gym had water on the floor. Mm. And then over on the walkway from Column House to Downs, there was about two inches of water on the, on the walkway. So that all was cleaned up very quickly. We, we didn't, we, I guess we had to move one class. So most of the damage at the other schools were, you know, limbs down, could, kids couldn't be in the playground at Bracket, for example, until those limbs are taken down. Um, there was some leaks at Hardy, a new leak that we didn't know about was, could leak. Um, <laughs> but A new leak. A new leak. Um, we're working on the leaks at Hardy. But the thing that, there was some leaks at, at Bishop, but amazingly, 
with all the efforts we've done recently, there was no water into the fifth grade, that fifth grade hall. Hmm. So I feel like we've made some significant progress there. So it was all very minor, but I just wanted to give you an update on, uh, in what happened. And that, that's it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, moving down to the uh, discussion on the format for the superintendent's evaluation. Mm -hmm. Our next meeting, uh, just to let the public know, uh, the school committee will be doing the annual evaluation of the superintendent. And uh, the intent of this discussion is to come to consensus on how the board, uh, the committee, would like to do this presentation. Uh, traditionally, we've done a round robin. Um, I, what you have either uh, electronically is just a suggestion. Uh, we, uh, part of the requirement is for the chair to do a compilation of all the members. But uh, at the same time, each member, if the, how we do this presentation, uh, what I gave you tonight is just a suggestion, which basically is, uh, let me get it up so I say it correctly. And it's not going to come up when I, oh, here it is. Uh, my suggestion is each member will have the opportunity to make an opening statement. Then the chair will read the superintendent evaluation compilation. Then e during this, each member may comment on each section. Uh, basically, uh, what I was thinking of is something similar to when we do the consent agenda. If there's a, uh, a member hears something or wants to comment on it, hold or whatever we agree on tonight. And then at the end, each member would have an opportunity to make a closing statement. This is just a suggestion. And so uh, in our discussion, I would ask us to talk about generalities, not specifics uh, that are within your documents or my document and stuff like that uh, at this time. So um, opening it up to the floor for any discussion this time. Ms. Starks. Um, I just ha I have a bunch of questions. Um, one is, uh, how will things be reported out? So how are you going to report those? I have out? no idea. I mean, uh, I thought this compilation, as I shared, uh, as it was a great idea as long as I was sitting over there and didn't have to do the compilation. Uh, so I think, so the I think one of the devils in the details, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so if you have a suggestion, uh, you want to make us okay? Know how you're gonna do but we we have in the in the forms that we have we have number ratings, mm -hmm. and one of the suggestions that I'll throw it out is that I add them up and divide by seven. No, no, there's no numbers. Mm -mm. Well, I, I, well, <laughs> I would assign a number to it. Yeah, I assign a number to each one of the. I'm sorry, to the values on it, mm -hmm. if that's the agreement, or I can state. On this particular item, there were three at this rating, two at this rating, one at yes, this rating. That's, that's I think that. Accurate. Yeah, that's. I, I think mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> that's more accurate. Good. We have one so, agreement. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That makes it a lot easier. Right. Uh, so. And then there'll be no real cumulative score. It'll just be kind of. Well, a, a, you know, this is. At the uh, on the final rating, is that how you want me to report the final? Rating? Because there has to be a a final rating, overall rating, for the superintendent. That's what the state wants, an overall rating. Now, we, we're still, I think, we, in our discussion, correct me if I'm wrong, that first rating has to be done by June next year, that official one, Well, or oh, sometime this year. We, we, you know, I, I would suggest I an mean, overall rating is a broad term. Overall rating could mean, could mean just what Cindy said, three members I believe it's proficient. Mm -hmm. the three believe it's. I think that's an overall. Mm -hmm. That's an overall I rating. I Let's get. Let, I I have no problem with that. Well, I think we should try submitting it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they it, may, it, kick, it it they may kick it and back, and then, and then we'll have learn. another discussion. Then we'll learn. Fine. Yeah. I, that's great. I, I think we do have to land on a central measure because, in the reporting system, you have to pick one of the four categories. I understand. Yeah. But but, in the past, with the exception uh, of Ms. Sue's, We've all done that, uh, we've presented that as an oral final rating on ourselves, mm -hmm. okay? So, I mean, I agree, give it a shot. If they don't like it, they'll let us know, I'm sure. Are you, Mr. Slickman, are you saying but, that- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Mr. Slickman is correct, you mm -hmm. have to have one. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. we have to have one for what? Because there are the many, overall. many, many. The final, the final. overall. Overall has to be one of these categories. One of those categories. Well, then I it, think we have to. We have to do are, are we reporting? Let, let me ask the superintendent. Are we reporting for you in the way that we're reporting for principals and teachers, by category and to, to the state uh, through electronically, and that we have to go through the the uh, the the. the what is it, four categories? The four and, standards. The four standards and, and the overall, that we have to report one ranking overall electronically. Uh, is that what they're asking us yes. to do? Yes. Okay. So we do have to land on one measure of central tenancy. Then I think Only on step three? On, on, on the four sub-areas and, and the final. On each of the four areas. But in each step of one, there is no overall. There are three different sections. And in step two, there are four different sections. Step three is the only one that has one. Mm -hmm. Step so four has one, and step five is just comments. Since it's a, it's not a numerical, it's not numerical then, it's an overall rating, then we have to it's just- categorical. It's, it's, it's more majority. If the majority- if, Maybe we need to vote it. Well, I could, I could report out th three said this, two said this, the majority is boom. Could you, is it possible to call somebody at the state just to get some guidance on this? I mean, they, I'll be happy to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they're because I, it's just really hard. I mean, there no, is no, I, for step one, there is no, you know, there's three sections. So how do you? Yeah, but I mean, it, how you roll that up? Let's but say, you, let's say professional practice. Uh, three of us say met. Three of us say significant progress. One says exceeded. Mm -hmm. So what's the rating? Wasn't well, step three supposed but to be based three on one sections. and two? Yeah, right. So it's, 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 I'm not sure. I think we need to, I think the state should be able to help us with this. So there should be somebody, or even the MASC. Mm -hmm. We're not the first district to. Well, Step three says that let me, let me just right? Right? share this with you. At last year's conference, these questions came up mm -hmm. and there was a lot of I don't knows. This has showed up at every EDCO meeting, uh, including yesterday. Uh, and they're bringing another speaker out because of all the questions that, the, we're not the only board having this, this issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, of right, right. ambiguity in their instructions. Well, okay, Kathy can call the MASS. I mean, you can call the Superintendent Association to see what they got. No, you don't want to do that. No, mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can do that. I, I do think that everybody is in a learning curve about this yeah. um, mm -hmm. because of this issue. Because when it's, if the teachers or administrators, there's one evaluator. Yeah, it's right, it's easier, much and easier. This, you know, you go through all of these, you, you, look, at the, you look at the rubrics, and uh, you, you determine it. Now, mm -hmm. One of the discussions we haven't had as a committee in thinking about this is, is what we've done with the teachers, and that is in the first year we did the evaluations for everybody, we really only looked at standard one and two. We had a, we had a gradual rollout because it's just very overwhelming. Um, it, now, teachers that were pre-professional, we had to look at the other two standards, but it was not given the same kind of weight and, and, and look at evidence. And that's, again, something we haven't really talked about here is what we're going to do about evidence other than yes, it's, the goals. I, mean, I, think, I think going forward, so, you know, this is a new form. We're all getting used to this. We were given evidence by the superintendent for the professional practice, student learning, district improvement goals. But then, there's all these other categories, instructional leadership, curriculum, instruction, assessment, evaluation, data, informed decision making, and it goes on and on. And the one thing I think going forward might be worth considering here is that either we select certain standards and ask for evidence, or we get evidence from the superintendent for everything we have to evaluate around. Because it's, it's a little bit difficult to go back over past minutes and yes. in the history of the school committee in 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, and figure out, you know, how we did on instruction, assessment, evaluation. It's just, it's just a lot. Well, and if, I, if, I, that's actually, okay. yeah, for some, it's hard. It, well, and if you weren't here, it's I, 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 was, I was given a pocket yes. that is very inadequate in terms right. of assessing these If I may. Things. Yeah, so anyway, going, so, going, uh, going, so, so I'm going to answer you. Oh, okay, here. On the 13th, I am going to announce that the superintendent evaluation subcommittee is going to meet in this December. The superintendent and I are going to meet prior to that and try to work out an outline of goals and set a timeline to do exactly and set the parameters going forward. 
to do exactly what you were just talking about. Because, because I don't, if, if, if there is, and I don't know, you know, all the conversations that are taking place at the state level, but if there's flexibility here, it's, you know, to pick one or two of these uh, uh, standards uh, in each of these categories and ask for evidence allows us to go deeper yes. into the evaluation mm -hmm. and is actually more helpful to anybody you're evaluating. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to be evaluating. You know, go, go deep in two or three categories rather than a broad range because you, it's just too much. So, so what do we do with this thing? I, mean, I think we have to just, well, this. <laughs> and especially an issue for me because I, yeah. I have less experience than you do. I had the same same and, experience you did. And there's some things that, in I know that nobody's made a fuss about something. So mm -hmm. does that mean <laughs> that proficient. the superintendent is proficient, exemplary, needs to, I mean, you know, no one has filed a lawsuit. Or yes. some, you know, there's certain things I just, I don't know if the superintendent is um, doing evaluations in a timely manner. I. I just have, I don't have personal evidence of it. I just know no one's mm -hmm. right. made a fuss, right? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of things like that. And there's no box where I say, I can write. Or I don't know. There's I don't know. I don't know. Well, right? I, this is my opinion. I have no problem on putting down uh, insufficient evidence. Do, uh, this is not an area of concern. This is, a, I will qualify that. And if I don't feel I have, so I, I have enough. So I another box or? Well, Go on the comments. Common area. You can write. Yeah, it's sure. a common sure. area, okay. and I would I would ask if you feel there's an ambiguity or you don't. It isn't an issue. You don't have sufficient right. stated okay. because I think this is important. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. as Dr. Bodie okay. said, everyone else has one evaluator. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bodie has seven, mm -hmm. uh, even, even with a compilation that's going to be there. From what I have heard from you folks, mm -hmm. that I will report out. The numbers of uh, the how many proficient, how many and th th like that. Are you read through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's th mm -hmm. that's another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, or they can just read the headings, mm -hmm. engagement. You know, right? Unless there's something. Don't read all the. Text. Unless this uh, some member has something mm -hmm. really I mean, I outstanding. Everyone's reading. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's so the there's, step, uh, there's steps and there's standards. Yes. Mm -hmm. The steps are fairly easy. They have big swaths yes. and they're easy to read out. The standards are, they have lots and lots of little ones, but for each one we have to give an overall, mm -hmm. each of us. Yes. And so I think that what we should do is not read every little one mm -hmm. and how everyone voted, but um, so for example, superintendent's performance rating for standard one instructional leadership you can just say overall of the seven of us, so many rated exemplary, yeah. proficient, needs improvement, satisfactory, without right. having to go into the sub bullets. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Because there's like five sub bullets for each yeah. one of these that are, that would take. I, I would think it's important to inform the public what the standards mean. I mean, you know, proficient. Yeah, yeah. He can read off those sub bullets and say these are the mm -hmm. things that we looked at. No, 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 no. Defining each one of the ratings. Define the indicators because the public's not going to understand the proficient exemplary. Oh, sure. That needs to be defined. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. as, as a prelude to the, the yeah, evaluation. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Okay, so let me write that down. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, go right ahead. Um, I think that because this, what, what's different about the position you're in than what we would be evaluating is we can do observations, we can, there's mm -hmm. a lot of things mm -hmm. that we can get. And for example, evaluations, you, you just simply can't have those, right. you know. And so it's sort of a, an odd indicator Weird. really in that whole piece of it. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of, an, an initial sort of go around in this as, as people are starting to get used to it, is they were looking at the goals and then the, the school committee picked out a couple of district goals that you, you want evidence on. And having that have a fair amount of weight because I think what you need to do is think about, well, what are some other areas that are, you particularly want evidence in? Now, all year long you get reports and you, but you know, basically some of the interactions more from what goes on at the committee or subcommittee meetings. So you have to sort of, extract your, your discernment from, um, from those kind of interactions. And it's, given the rubrics, it's sort of hard. And I think that, that, that Ms. Starks is correct, that you, you sort of have to look at the big standards and sort of do a, an overall on it. It's, it's, you're in a tough spot, and nobody's really figured this out well no. right now. No. Again, I want to make it clear, are we all going to be giving a rating in all four standards. Yes. 
I don't want to be in a position like we were last year where a couple of us did four, some did two. Mm -hmm. We have to be, so if you choose do? not to give a rating on that, that's fine. But I want us to all be clear that we're looking at all four standards. Yeah, but I, I think people have the right to say all steps, mm -hmm. all four standards. But let's say management operations, mm -hmm. uh, law, ethics, and policies. I I don't have enough information to answer that. If you that, want, that's fine. I just don't want I. If, and uh, this is not a negative comment. I mean it this way. I felt a little blindsided because I and I think it was my fault. I didn't make it clear. I went down through all the things, and some of us didn't. And I just if. If somebody chooses to go through the whole thing, mm -hmm. that's fine. There's a lot of these here. I agree with Mr. Thielman. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have information. I don't feel it's appropriate at this time mm -hmm. to be making a judgment. Yeah. Yes. I'm just looking at this thinking. Kathy wants to if, uh, she, oh. She's been waiting if, to. If I understand how this is being done, you're going to have to take this and fill out a computer form. And you're going to have all these questions and you're going to have to pick boxes that express our committee's opinion of for for each category and stuff so i'm thinking well, as we don't know that's what okay i that's why got, the calling needs to be made in the state yeah i got that feeling from dr Bodie. so um, for example for example let's take the example management you, you just you're right there's so many so much in this so what you do with the, dist the district goals, you decide what are the big priorities in terms of that category. And we had some, some, some yeah. things this year that had to do with the high school SOI, Stratton. So you've already pre-selected the things in that standard that are high priority. That's for right? next year's evaluation. No, if you go back up on, on the forms that mm -hmm. Cindy was good enough to fill in on these things, there is uh, taken from, uh, Last year's goals. The last goals, year's goals. Right. Last year's goals. You already selected what are some big ideas in each one of those instructional yes. categories. Right, right. Instructional management, yeah, PD. Yeah. And so you've already selected the indicators, in a sense, that you want, wanted me to focus on. Right. And so basically, in some ways, this is just a different format than how we used to do it. We had district goals, and what you wanted to know at the end of the year is evidence on all the goals in terms of how we did. And that's sort of the same idea here. And so to be clear, but we're evaluating, this so everyone knows, and the public too, yeah. we're evaluating you on FY14, the 2013-2014 school. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. So I think it's, mm -hmm. that needs to be. We, yeah. But again, just to clarify, yeah. the reason we moved it to November yeah. was to also include the MCAS results. And we've, yeah, we've just which finished. we have, right. Okay. It's the 13-14 year ended technically on July on June 30th, mm -hmm. but because we've extended to November, we're including this piece of it too. That aspect only of the 14th. Yeah. Okay. Well, the MCAS are for last right. year anyway. Right. Exactly. Uh, okay. Just for the old man to make sure he's got it clear. You folks are going to give me hopefully tonight. Mm -hmm. you, and if you got I thought we had till the end of the month. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was okay. fine. Got yeah. another week. Do mm -hmm. not do yes. that. Yes. <laughs> The policy, and I'm only saying this because I twisted somebody's arm over here, said the second meeting of October. You well, get, no, no, he gets plaudits, he gets extra stars for his, his being done. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'm going to ask you all, I would, I would ask you to if, to, if you could accommodate me by sending it to me electronically. Mm -hmm. That would make my life a lot easier. It's going to be scanned. I'm going to scan in my written copy and send it mm -hmm. to you. That's fine. Is your, am I going to be calling you for clarification of your handwriting? I don't know. Okay. You can type in the comment box. So, you know, it's almost like typing in no, the comment box. No, okay. Well, then, there is, all right. You know, okay, fine. Okay, it, okay. Like that. This is between Ms. Stax and me, <laughs> and this is allowable for clarification. I want to be on record with that. The other thing is that, um, I lost it. We're sending it to you and Karen, right? Just to... Yes. Yeah. At, I want to remind everybody and our, our newest member that during the, the meeting itself, any note taking during this mm -hmm. is subject to going to Ms. Uh, Fitzgerald at the end of the meeting during this. If you take any notes, mm -hmm. they're, they're very clear on that. If you express those notes. Wait, they, they get handed to her. Uh, yes. Or, okay. what, what I'm saying is in, in the past, a, a member might have said something that all of a sudden, before I got to speak, it jogged my memory or something, I would add a comment mm -hmm. to my actual written one. Mm -hmm. 
and it might have been on a side note or something. Right. That, but I would verbalize it so it be that written is is required. Any note taking during that is required. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I am going to send to the committee through Ms. Fitzgerald, and I would ask any response go back through Ms. Fitzgerald for clarification only. My understanding of your charge tonight for what is going to happen on the 13th of uh, November. If it's not clear, I, again, I will send it through Ms. Fitzgerald to the members. My understanding, I would ask you individually, if it's, I'm not on the right track, please clarify it back through Ms. Fitzgerald to me. And I'll go, yes. If you get clarification that you will have to fill out an electronic form of this, which means you have to make choices between yes. one category or the other, when you do your compilation, can you say, this many people chose this category, this many people chose that category, I'm going to, with the committee's permission, I'm going to, to check this category, and then we can talk about it. During right. the actual evaluation meeting? Yeah, during the actual I have no problem with that. I'm saying, you know, if, if right. you are going to have to do that, yeah. then I think it is good to report out everybody's, but then say, and so I'm choosing this one. Fine. The meeting's not for another three weeks, so if you do get some information from the state that informs us, I think it's, you should share it with all of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That, again, through Ms. Fitzgerald. Great. We all set? Like the first evaluation I participated in, this went a lot smoother than I thought it would. Wait, wait, actually, just clear, so I sent it to you and to you? No. No, don't send it to you. Yeah, it's, it's you. Ms. Fitzgerald is going to be the conduit. Okay. Correct. Okay. The evaluation just goes to No, no. the evaluation, evaluation, I'm sorry, the evaluation comes, a copy goes to Ms. Fitzgerald and to me. So, so CC. Put it as an attachment, CC her. Got it, okay. That's, that's fine. We're all set? Oh, I'm so excited. We are now moving to MASC Delegate Assembly. Mm -hmm. Turn it over to Mr. Schleckman. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, th the thing I want to emphasize before we uh, descend into this little topic is, is that the only thing that is really debatable within the course of a resolution is the therefore be it resolved statement. Uh, what will happen, has anyone besides Mr. Hainer seen a delegate assembly at MASC? I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sort of like town meeting. Um, and you get one member from each school committee sitting in the room and, and they're going over through the warrant articles, in this case being the resolutions. And the item before us is the therefore be it resolved statement. So all the whereases are just commentary and not subject to, uh, to amendment. Um, and, and, and that's what's going to be voted. Now, sometimes uh, committees will come prepared with an amendment. Uh, what ha often happens is that at a meeting such as this, the school committee will tell their delegate, uh, inform their delegate as to how the committee feels about the resolution and instruct him. Uh, on some, some committees never do that. Some committees do it on just a few of them. One of the resolutions is one that we joined uh, Chelmsford, Lincoln, Sudbury, Menden, Upton, Northbridge, Holbrook, Woburn, and Worcester to sponsor. That's resolution number six. So uh, the, the assumption right now is that we support resolution six because we've already voted that. Uh, my suggestion is we go very quickly through the resolutions and ask whether or not we want to instruct our delegate uh, or uh, uh, re pertaining to that resolution. Resolution number one is uh, that the MASC file and support legislation will require institutions providing out of district placements for education uh, which are private providers to file end of year reports that reflect in detail inclusiveness that of corporate annual reports and stock offering schedules and post salaries of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I mean, there's a feeling out there among school committee members that uh, we have to do extensive reporting, but the cost of private placements are going way up, and there's really no accountability for why this is happening. That's the, sort of the rationale for this resolution. I mean, uh, if, if, I move to make and vote yes. 
Uh, I <laughs> to vote in favor. Okay. I move to instruct our delegate to vote in favor of this resolution. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Yeah. Paul, does this mean if it says submitted by Framingham School Committee, it means no other school committees signed on to it? Right. I mean, you don't, you don't have to. All, one school committee There's can enough. sponsor it. Right. And then it goes to the resolutions committee. And if they approve it, it goes to the board of directors. And if they approve it, it goes before the delegate assembly. So there's a screening process. Mm -hmm. A couple of school committees presented uh, resolutions that we didn't think should go before the delegate assembly, so we rejected them. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a level of approval on this. The, the, the rules of MASC, however, say that if you have five school committees from either two or three different divisions in total, uh, sponsoring something it goes automatically to the delegate assembly it's not uh, the, uh, the the sub the committee and the uh, board of directors can't bump it off and that's sort of what happened with the one that we jointly sponsored let's take a look at number two number two um, universal quality pre-kindergarten so that therefore be it resolved that MAS, MASC file or support legislation that will provide the appropriation for universal pre-k in Massachusetts and will take the steps necessary to provide access to good quality universal pre-k for all children in Massachusetts. I just have to ask is it understood that the state's going to fund it? That's what it says. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what it says. No mm -hmm. I said is it understood? No. Well. <laughs> just saying that we support them mm. funding it. Is there a motion? So moved. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I just want to know if, is there any way to caveat it that they can't take it from our other funds? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. No, 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 it's it, true. It's, I didn't you know, think of that. No, I, I. Oh, well, that, that's sort of the end, uh, provide the appropriation for universal pre-K. That's implying, I would think, in the resolution. Now, we're not writing the legislation. We can't. But I think the, there's, there's sort of this an is, intent from this us. Is, this is to start yeah. the process for legislation. Yeah. We're not going to get mm -hmm. bound. Okay. okay. You've heard my concern. I heard Please it. I'll pass time. it. Yeah. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Number three. Uh, is charter school reform, which is an, another accountability measure, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot in the therefore be it resolved. So I'll give it a quick, I'll try to be as fast as I can. MASC call upon the legislature to enact charter school reform legislation that will include provisions that require uh, the Board of Elementary and Secondary ed Education to consider social and economic impact upon the districts from which newer expanding charter schools would recruit students, require a strong provision to prevent skimming and suspensions from charter schools that return students whom they no longer wish to enroll to the sending districts, finance reforms so that charter school expropriations from local Chapter 70 funds funding does not severely damage the sending district, require timely reporting on accountability with meaningful data on student attendance, expulsion, suspensions, students at economic risk in comparison with the sending districts, establishment of benchmarks to measure success, establishment of a formula for evaluating school districts that use a growth component that's no less than 50% of the formula and require on an annual basis that reporting of best practices and innovation to the sending districts. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to abstain from this, and, 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 and I'm going to explain why. Uh, if a charter school were to come to Arlington, I would have a lot to say about it. But I sit on something called the Boston Compact in uh, Boston, which was set up by the mayor, and it's a coalition of private charter and public schools, and we're all in a right. conversation, a collaboration, trying to find ways to work together. And uh, mm. so, I live in Arlington, but I work in Boston, and I don't want to I got a mayor I got to work with there. So let's, uh, <clears throat> I'm abstaining. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Abstention, I abstain. Right. Thank you. Uh, resolution number four, fingerprinting. There, therefore be it resolved that MASC calls upon the legislature to establish such legislation that required the administering agencies conduct a periodic system review to consider means of streamlining and reducing costs of operation ensure that teachers be fingerprinted upon their initial licensure under the supervision of DESI, establish the requirement that teachers be fingerprinted upon their recertification if they are not already fingerprinted, uh, establish DESI as a clearinghouse for all background checks for all educators. Uh, Mr. Spiegel seems to have an opinion. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Is there a motion? Move to we, approve. A second. Yes. Rob, what's your opinion? Go ahead. So when they say that DESE is going to be the clearinghouse, hmm. are school districts going to have access to the actual background reports? One would think so. The, okay. Yeah. Because we don't have that access now from other districts. They can't be shared. Mm -hmm. um, but we can get what's called a suitability determination. And if another district found an employee suitable, we have the option to rely on that. Yeah, I think what, what they're trying to do is turn this into a situation where as instead of all the districts having to go and do this, that it be done centrally through DESE, yeah. and that we can call upon it if we're hiring the, uh, the employee. Okay. And then that would be sort of rolled into the certification fee? Into the licensure, yeah. The licensure yeah. fee, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I know. I understand now. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed. Number five. Number five. Therefore, be it resolved that MASC supports the reinstatement of federal earmarks for school district, regional school districts, and municipalities throughout the federal appropriations process. Motion. So moved. Second. Paul, could you give a little more? Uh, basically, what happened is that they stopped earmarking in the federal level, uh, uh -huh. and uh, some of the earmarking uh, directed revenue, uh, resources and revenues into municipalities and school districts, okay. and we're looking to restore the practice. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Number six. I don't six. think we need to talk about six because we've already approved it. Yes. Uh, number seven, um, therefore be it resolved the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education conduct further examinations of options for a state evaluation and accountability system um, and to substantively involve educators and school committee members in the process of choosing an assessment <laughs> instrument and to refrain from committing to any instrument before the process is complete. Just in terms of background, let me say that there were a couple of districts that were looking to to toss out park and, and another couple of districts that were looking to get rid of the common core. And we shot down the let's get rid of common core, uh, seeing that we're already well into common core and it would be chaos to do that. And we didn't want to do this as, uh, as a park versus not park discussion, but more in terms of having some input into the process. Uh, there are some districts uh, in particular that are concerned that with the commissioner's participation on, on the park board that the, uh, the selection of park uh, uh, is not objective. So that's the origin of this resolution. Motion? Move so to approve. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Schlickman. The uh, proposals to amend the bylaws are basically procedural. They, they, it, it, uh, it shouldn't be controversial. I hope. Okay. Consent agenda. Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so request, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 15046, dated 10-9-2014, in the amount of $552,429.61. Approval of draft minutes, none. Approval of new date for New York City Arlington High School FE student trip, January 16th through the 18th, 2015. Motion to approve? So moved. Yeah. Second? Any further? No, there's none. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, Policies and procedures? We'll be meeting on the 28th at 530. Thank you. Budget, Ms. Starks? Um, so everyone has the uh, budget calendar. Are there any changes? All right, so motion to approve the budget timeline as presented. Is Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. All right, and uh, we are working on finding a date for a future meeting. Thank you. Community relations? Uh, we met on October 1st, and do we have a copy of the additional questions? Yes. We were given. Oh, they're, okay, they're here, okay. That's a lot of questions. Uh, this one? No, no not no. the additional ones. Oh, no, the, one, no. the other one we have no that, that's the That's the stock questions, and this is what we're adding on to. Those are not the exact questions, actually. That's a sample.
example of what they might look like. Mm -hmm. um, but but there, 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 there are five-point Likert scale. Uh, most of them are five-point Likert scale. Uh, you know, from strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Um, and we'll be on for the ones that the uh, National Center uh, are publishing. Um, We'll, we'll be able to compare them nationally. And I think it's going to be a good thing. And we had an extensive discussion over additional questions. We didn't want to go into uh, things that might impact negotiations or have uh, or really belong in another venue. So we may do a, a, a future survey on how we allocate our calendar for early release days, a couple of other things that we didn't put in here because there wasn't a continuity. But the six questions before you are the ones that we discussed and decided that, that we should add. So um, that's what we have in terms of the, um, uh, of the uh, NCSL parent survey. Okay. Ms. Stocks. I don't like question three. Our question three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about my child demonstrates anxiety to any test? Just having that question tells you nothing. Are they anxious going to school? Are they anxious taking a test? Are they anxious going to the dentist? Mm. Okay, so just because MCAS, mm -hmm. that, I, that doesn't tell me anything. Are they an anxious kid? So I don't like that question. I feel like it's setting us up for, I don't know, like a lot of, what are you gonna do about it? Complaint to Tessie. <laughs> I mean, in my, I mean, in my estimation, you're going to ask questions because you have something that you're going to do with the information that you get. That, that was I sort don't of, know yeah. what that's, yeah, what we're going to do with that, and I just feel like it kind of sets us up for. Can I speak to that? Sure. One of ahead. the things that I liked in our subcommittee meeting, and we talked about this in depth, was the fact that. And it was evidenced, I think, this week at more than 100 parents, I think, showed up at the mm -hmm. audits and to talk about this very issue. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, I think, approaching an epidemic type of level, not only in our district, yes, but anxiety, in other districts. But not, right. not just standardized testing anxiety, anxiety in general. Well, perhaps, but it is evidenced, I think, in a lot of students when approaching a big type of test. Well. Okay. Anecdotally. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hear that, but I tend to agree with Ms. Starks. Mm -hmm. An anxious child can, can, a test can bring out the anxiety. Mm -hmm. The anxiety can be uh, caused by a variety of variables. In the, I think, it, it, does your child uh, demonstrate anxiety? With regard to school, well, maybe. Thank maybe, you. maybe, you know, maybe uh, having something that, to do with generally with school. Like is school an anxiety producing time for your child? That would, that would be more interesting to me and that says to me, oh, we need more social workers or he mental health workers or. I think the testing that we just, that was presented to us a couple of weeks ago uh, by mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Bovier talks about anxiety more in that, school anxiety right. more in general. And th there are many things that may cause it. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree that this narrows it down too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, like that, I think. Uh, I, mean, I agree. There's no, a lot of anxiety. Point. Yeah. I mean, I have kids who don't want to come to school. I have a lot of issues. Right. But I think it would have informed the behavioral supports that we're putting or budgeting for. Right. And I, that would be right. a useful right. tool. Right. I mean, I mean, right. We, knowing the level of anxiety is, is valuable. You're saying knowing the level of anxiety just about the test isn't it? Yes. Right. Okay. I see what you're right. Saying. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. And just to so clarify, this is a case. This is a survey of all parents. Yes. And yes. The youth risk behavior survey was just. Youth risk high school. Just high school. The youth, youth middle, risk behavior was just middle and. Uh, just, just high, high school. High school. High school. It was just high school. Okay, okay so that's where Mr. Schleitz. Just so, uh, so we can proceed, I, I will make a motion to approve <clears throat> the National Center for School Leadership survey with the six additional questions from the community relations meeting. Uh, and make that as a motion, which we can then amend uh, if okay. we want to change the wording on questions. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. Is Cindy's anybody? amendment, which is okay. Well, my amendment is to modify question number three to read, my child demonstrates anxiety with regard to school. Okay. Is there a second for that amendment? Second. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment as presented by Ms. Starks? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Fine. On the main motion. 
Uh, all those in favor? Can we have oh, discussion on the main motion? Right right ahead. Um, how is the survey conducted? What if you have two children? Uh, we talked extensively about that. Um, uh, Dr. Woody was going to find out more information about whether people could submit multiple questions to be or yeah. multiple answers. Because it's um, school specific, you, you, you indicate, um, if you look on, that, on the questionnaire, um, they will have some demographic information and so the idea is to get the level and if that's the case, um, then we would want to make sure that that information was available. So no. you would be able. I have you would two be kids. able to. I have you, one at Otis okay. and one at Stroud. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you would be able so to respond on two surveys. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that was that didn't come so the same IP address yeah. could give two surveys. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. so if you're so lucky I can enough to have one at the high school, you get three. Okay. okay. Um, so how are you verifying that? And. The through the portal. What if you what have if both I of them at 12 Stratton? Times and I have one kid. People tend not to so how do you answer these questions that yeah, talk my child has anxiety? What? Hmm? She if you two have two kids oh. at the same school, you only get one survey. Yeah. How do you answer a question of my child has? You're right. You're right. And some of the, and the yeah, and one, they're probably very different. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no well, it's, an issue. Um, it's not perfect. The, that's the problem with the can uh, Well, you could change the, one of my children, or at least one or more of my children has. It's going to muddy. Well, you're gonna that's going to be, that's no impossible what. for each question then, because so, yeah, this so one, data. my child was challenged. Well, yeah. maybe one yeah. was, one yeah. wasn't. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the questions in the main survey are child specific too, which is why the you can answer it one for each child is, 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 or one, is, is a critical aspect of the answer. Right, except you can't if they're both in the same school. No, well, there's no reason why you can't run through it twice. I Let's wasn't hearing that being an option. Is that an option? I believe it will be an option. First of all, this is going to go out through Alert Now, mm -hmm. and you can you can you'll have the URL for it, so you would be able to do it even in different emails. Um, I I can find out whether when they submitted for one email whether then they don't allow that again. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but yeah, I will find out. cancels it out. Okay. So mm -hmm. then my other point was just that in our goals this year, mm -hmm. we have doing a dashboard of district metrics mm -hmm. um, to be developed and also that the district website will be analyzed and changes implemented mm -hmm. to improve the communication. And, and I'm just think mm -hmm. I'm not seeing when I look at the questions that they're, they're called a generic questions, I'm not seeing lots of information that we're gathering for either of those goals. Hmm. And yeah. so we only very briefly talked about dashboard because just because of time limitations. Um, I don't think in, we were thinking of dashboard mm. as tying into the survey as much. What, j what are you thinking of? Well, it, it's a satisfaction survey so that, you know, other things that are of interest to us, we really, we're, we're have, we, we started to play with the idea of bringing other things in, and then we, we started pushing them away uh, because they were inconsistent with the intent of the survey. So we, we had starting a dashboard conversation on the agenda for the last meeting. We ran out of time. We're going to start talking about that next, and we, we can we, we, I, I think the process of finding out what's useful on a dashboard is sort of a different exercise. Or on a website. Or on the website. I think we might need another survey for okay. what parents okay. go to the website okay. for okay. to get information. I can see okay. where you're going with yeah. that, but okay. I, just, okay. I think yeah, we're no, out that, of. And we could put that on the website okay. in such a way that, okay, you're a user of the website. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. Okay. I, I think you're right, though. We do need to. Yeah. No, okay. Ask okay. About we ready to vote on the approval? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. Uh, okay. Uh, Curriculum instruction and assessment accountability. Nothing to report. Okay, facilities. Facilities subcommittee is gonna meet on Thursday, October 30th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it's- 30? It was gonna be six and then somehow it got changed in the turn. Did it get changed because the, the uh, negotiations ends at six? Ah. six. Well. Whatever. Hmm. We'll take- If we're all there, we can start. Well, okay, you really can't. Okay, 
so six, it's going to be 6.30, I'm sorry. So it's 6.30 on, on the 30th. Uh, there are three issues on the agenda. One is a space strategy discussion with the district on how we're going to address the potential for more students in the districts ne next uh, fall and what our planning is for that. And with a conversation about two buildings, I guess, Dallin and Brackett that are crowded. Uh, there was a request that Jennifer sent over to me from the parents at the Hardy. Yeah, and uh, this is sort of being addressed, but I, I wanted to bring it to people's attention on the facilities because it's uh, facilities matter. All right. Well, I mean, if it's, if it's resolved by next week, it, it, we don't, I don't need to know. Talk about no, it. actually, I think this larger question of several playgrounds that are part of the schools um, under the schools AGS versus other playgrounds that are part of the towns is sort of a bigger question that is, I, from what I understand, beginning to be looked at, but I think. Okay. Needs more study. All right. So, yeah. and then Bill asked for an update on the Mononabe Preschool. Just the conditions. Because we had a meeting about it last yeah. year. We so. have been ongoing. All right. right. October 30th, 6.30 p.m. Can we make it 6.15? Just come and sell. What do you want to do? You want to let's move just, let's talk again and, and update if we need to. We've got plenty of time. To update update to six. Time. Oh. Time. Let's up, time. So let's make it at six. Yeah, okay, let's change it to 6. And I'll be, I gotta redo the agenda to put all these three things on there. So we'll make it back to 6 p.m. There must have been a mis must have been miscommunication. I'm, we'll make it 6 and if we... Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Well said. Okay. Special study group on superintendent's evaluation. I've indicated at the next meeting I'll get, have a specific time and date for you. Uh, and uh, the chair would just like to quickly report uh, at the EDCO meeting yesterday, she had the 11 uh, school uh, districts were represented with 15 people. The first meeting usually shares uh, concerns at your district, which sets the agenda for EDCO for the rest of the year uh, on that. And the two major issues that came out, uh, with one exception, was enrollment growth, and the other one was stress and anxiety. That was problem. That was an issue. So we're going to school we're, committee members. No, yes. <laughs> that that was expressed in another venue. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, commend to the committee and to Dr. Uh, Bodie. Dr. Jessen uh, spoke at a weekly Rotary meeting yesterday. They, a group of people who don't always sit attentively, were very attentive. Uh, it was a very, very fascinating and interesting uh, talk she gave, and uh, she was just really wonderful. So thank you very much. Um, let's see, okay, that ends that, and uh, I will entertain a motion to oh, adjourn. Well, before uh, we do that, one, one other oh. thing. Uh, the recommendation on the appointment to the uh, uh, Poet Laureate Committee, Dr. Uh, Bodie, we have one resident. Oh, yes. yes, we have um, we have one nominee um, who is also a resident of Arlington and is a the librarian paraprofessional at Thompson, uh, Liza Haley. So I move her appointment. Second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any? No discussion on that. Excuse me. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice job.